So it's really great that we have an opportunity to arrange this interesting and very important conference uh, here in Moscow in such difficult conditions. So nothing can kill real science and scientists that want uh, to know the truth, that want to know, to understand the international situation and process that now we can see in our region and in Indonesia and in Southeast Asia. So I'm very proud to open international round table, Russian-Indonesian cooperation, strategic objectives of uh, development in the new international environment. Our conference is devoted for the seventh anniversary of diplomatic relations for achievements and tasks for the future in relations between uh, Russia and Indonesia. So I think uh, I want to add that we arrange uh, this uh, conference in cooperation, uh, cooperation with the High School of Economics and uh, Institute of Oriental Studies. So I think it's a very solid foundation uh, for our future investigation and for our discussions. So I am uh, welcome uh, all the participants uh, to take part in this conference and I want to give words to Ambassador of the Indonesia, Republic of Indonesia for the Russian Federation, uh, the, His Excellency Mohamed Wahid uh, Supraidi. So, uh, please, uh, we'll begin uh, this conference with the, the greetings uh, from uh, uh, Indonesian Embassy, and this will be the beginning of our conference. So, please. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> thank you, moderator. It's my great honor and pleasure for me to join you in this very important conference, uh, marking the uh, 70th anniversary of our diplomatic relations. And we do it, unfortunately, through a virtual uh, conference because of the unfortunate uh, pandemic, uh, COVID-19. Uh, this is not only timely for the both countries, but also timely for me because this is almost the end of my term in uh, Russia. So uh, my term will end in June. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't, we cannot may or maybe organize uh, something like you know farewell lunch or dinner, but we can have virtual lunch. <laughs> so, so it's very economical. Uh, now, <clears throat> I would start with uh, the <clears throat> early relations because we have long relations, and actually, uh, I still cannot find the uh, the, the correct research on that, but. Uh, uh, long before, even during the Tsarist uh, emperor, uh, there has been relations between in Indonesia uh, uh, and, and Russia at the time, back in the 13th century, when uh, one of the nine saints, or we call it Walisong, the nine saints of a Muslim uh, clerk, actually one coming from Samarkand, <clears throat> his name is Ibrahim Asmar Kondi. That was also written in the uh, Japanese uh, historical uh, uh, theme. Uh, he's the first actually who introduced Islam in, in Java. And un uh, unlike what we thought before, uh, that Islam came mostly from Middle East and China, but also partly from Samarkand, which is at the time uh, belonged to the Russian uh, uh, uh kingdom. Now, <clears throat> a researcher named <coughs> Nikolai Maklova Maklay visited Batavia and Ternate in 1873. Mikulo, Mikluko, uh, a Russian and expert in ethnology, anthropology, and biology, went on expedition to the Philippines, Papua New Guinea, and Papua. For time visiting Papua to investigate the local tribes and culture, he wrote five books which become reference in the field of Southeast Asian studies for European anthropologists. The last Russian emperor, Nikolai uh, Alexandrovich, or Nicholas II, uh, visited Bratislava on the 23rd of February to March 1890. And in the beginning of the 19th century, he appointed the first Russian consul, Mr. Bakunin, uh, posted in Batavia. 
Bakunin served as vice consul in Batavia in the period of 1894 to 1899. <clears throat> Later in 1902, Bakunin wrote 456-page memoir with the title The Netherlands Tropica, Five Years in Java. This book also contains the first Russian Malay dictionary, which consists 500 words and phrases. Bakunin's book helped promote Indonesian studies in Russia. <clears throat> In the early 1920s, Russian scientist Alexander Huber conducted systematic studies on several countries in Southeast Asia, including Indonesia, the Philippines, and Vietnam. Huber's work was completed in 1932 into a book titled Indonesia Social Economic Sketch. And this is actually the first time that the term of Indonesia is introduced in, in, uh, in Western uh, academics work. <clears throat> In 1945, an Indonesian study was formally established at the Institute of Asian and African Studies at Lomonosov University, State, Moscow State University, and uh, followed by the uh, University of Leningrad in 1950, now St. Petersburg State University. Uh, meanwhile, the Department of uh, Russian Studies in Indonesia was opened at the University of Indonesia and Pajajaran University in Bandung. The Soviet Union formally recognized Indonesia's sovereignty on 28 January 1950 and expressed its intention to establish diplomatic relations with Indonesia. In 1954, both countries opened their respective embassies in Jakarta and Moscow. Dr. Subandrio became the first ambassador on the Republic of Indonesia and he later became our foreign minister, <coughs> while Mr. Dmitry Zukov became the first ambassador of the USSR uh, to the Republic of Indonesia. The Soviet Union also opened consulates in Java, uh, in Surabaya, Banjarmasin, and Medan in 1962. <clears throat> now we come to the <clears throat> old order period or order lava, <clears throat> which uh, I regard is one of the golden era in our relations during uh, the government of President Sukarno and uh, leader of Soviet at the time, uh, Nikita Khrushchev. <clears throat> Following the World War II, the period of 1947 to 91, <coughs> we know as the uh, Cold War era, was filled in with tension between the two superpowers, the United States with its Western Bloc and Soviet Union with its Eastern Bloc. The two countries fought for influence in the spheres and threatened each other. This era was characterized by Amris, Espionas, as well as ideological welfare. Indonesia fought against colonialism and proclaimed its independence in 1945. This Indonesia became a huge proponent of colonialism. This principle is enshrined in the preamble of the 1945 constitution, affirming that colonialization of the world should be abolished. Indonesia's first president, Sukarno, became a prominent figure in internal fora in advocating anti-colonialism. In 1955, Indonesia successfully hosted the first Asian African Conference in Bandung, which discussed a number of agendas, including the fight against colonialism and neocolonialism. We noted after this uh, first international conference, uh, there are many different countries that uh, became independent. In 1956, Indonesia started to fight to reclaim West Irian viewed by Sukarno as undisputed territory of the Republic. Indonesia's campaign to reclaim West Iran was supported by the Soviet Union as a proof of its commitment and recognition of the Indonesian territorial integrity. Sukarno worked to seek support from US and USSR in order to modernize its military capability. US was reluctant to assist Indonesia due to its close relations with the Netherlands. On the contrary, the USSR response was very positive. Sukarno visited Soviet Union for the first time in August, September 1956, then on the 5th of June 1961. The Soviet Union gave its support in the form of advanced military defense equipment to Indonesia, such as warships, submarines, fighter planes, and tanks. Projects in the field of military cooperation between the two countries conducted by the USR loan, uh, by the USR loan scheme amounted to one billion US dollar. 
Indonesia also sent troops and military personnel to join military technical training in Moscow and Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. Well, the USSR sent around uh, 1,000 instructors to Indonesia to provide technical training. Indonesia's army was greatly modernized thanks to the support of the Soviet Union and made it the strongest military power in Southern Hemisphere. Historians recorded that Indonesian pilots and sailors joined military training in Sevastopol and in Vladivostok in, 19, uh, in 1961. It is very interesting, actually, uh, the first batch of the Navy included my uncle. So he was sent to Soviet Union at the time uh, in 1961. And I just uh, uh, noticed later on that uh, one of his uh, daughter is named Rusiani Wati. So it's come from the word Russia because when she was born, actually he was still in Vladivostok. The close relation between the two countries and the success of Sukarno to establish a personal relation with the chairman of the uh, council minister, Mr. Nikita Khrushchev, during the time, during this time, marked the first period of golden era in our relationship. Now we come to the new order. In the third coup by the Indonesian Communist Party or PKI on the 30th September, turned the Republic into the anti-communist country. The communist ideology was formally banned and the party that was established in 1920 uh, and by 1965, it became one of the strongest communist parties in the world, right behind the Communist Party of Soviet Union and China. <clears throat> After its early tendency to follow Moscow's line between 1956 and 1964, PKI under leadership of Aydin started to lean on Beijing between 1963 to 1964, which we called Beijing Axis. It was based on the idea of an agrarian revolution with the dogma called villages besieged by the city to rise to power, a different concept of Moscow's relatively peaceful communism under President Nikita Khrushchev. Dr. Salem Said, in his book, Tatu Gestapo, said that during his visit to Moscow in 1962, yes. I did was strongly reminded by the ideologist of the Soviet Communist Party, Michael Suslov. He said that, make, that PKI had gone too far from the real goal of the communist ideology. And he even reminded that uh, unless you, could, you change, I will destroy you to your enemy. This is uh, uh, based on the interview uh, of Dr. Sam Said with I did brother live in France. <clears throat> Since taking office, <clears throat> President Suharto fully determined to eliminate PKI from the Indonesian Communist Party. PKI's ideology was considered incompatible with the Indonesian ideology of Pancasila in the 1945 constitution. Communism was restricted and prohibited for discussion in various fora. The new order government finally severed diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China on the 30 August 1967, based on presumption that PRC was directly involved in the coup. In order to finance the country development, President Suharto seek for long-term loans from the Intergovernmental Groups on Indonesia, or IGGI, which then recommend recommendations into the Consultative Group for Indonesia, or CGI, a group of creditor countries to Indonesia. This group is generally comprised of developed countries from the West. IGGI was formed in 1967, followed by CGI in 1992. With the loan finance development, the government's debt skyrocketed skyrocketed, and it compelled Indonesia to rely heavily on the West. Although Indonesia's GDP grew by between 6 to 7 percent during the new order, its debt loan increased significantly every year. Meanwhile, Indonesia's relations with Eastern Bloc countries, especially with the Soviet Union, were stagnant, if not casual. Relations with the Soviet Union was carefully maintained, and both agreed not to interfere in their domestic affairs. President Suharto, with its first visit to Soviet Union in 1989, where he met Soviet leader Mitter Mikhail Gorbachev to explore areas of cooperation based on mutual benefit. Both leaders signed the statements on the fundamentals of friendly relations 
and cooperation between the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic and the Republic of Indonesia on the 11th September 1989. Now the post new order era. With the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, President Boris Yeltsin government tried to liberalize the economy. During the period of 1992-1998, the liberal economic experiment failed to improve the Russian uh, welfare. In his New Year's address on the 31st December 1999, President Boris Yeltsin resigned and appointed Vladimir Putin as acting president. Later won the Russian presidential election in 2000. During the period of 2000-2008, thanks to the oil boom, the Russian government spent profits to pay for its foreign debt and started to spend the money for economic development that had been neglected during the previous years. Despite some global challenges, the Indonesia's Russia's bilateral relations grew stronger on the basis of spirit of friendship, equality, mutual respect, and understanding. One of the new milestones in the relations was the signing of the Declaration on the Framework of Friendship and Partnership Relations between the Republic of Indonesia and the, Republic, and the Russian Federation on the 21st century, signed by President Megawati Sukarno Putri and President Vladimir Putin on the 21st April 2003 during her visit to Russia. The document served as the basis for strategic cooperation between the two countries in the global, regional, and bilateral level. Meanwhile, President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono visited Russia on 9 to 10 September 2012 to attend the 24th APEC summit in Vladivostok and the G20 summit in St. Petersburg on the 5th to 6th September 2013. The, president, the, the presence of the president is important with regard to the handover on the chairmanship of APEC from Russia to Indonesia from the year 2013. In the G20 summit in St. Peter Peak 2013, Indonesia continued to promote sustainable development, whereas financial inclusion is a key issue for the developing countries. Russia also continues to strengthen relationships and partnerships with some of the key countries in Asia, such as China, India, and Indonesia. Russia is increasingly aware that Southeast Asia is an important region with a huge potential, especially in the economic field. In Russia's look east policy, improvement of economic cooperation with Asia, including Southeast Asia, will help Russia, Russian development, especially in Siberia and Far East regions. Russia also needs Asian countries to promote regional cooperation in combating terrorism, maintaining security and stability, and promoting dialogue and civilization. Therefore, Russia is actively takes part in the integration process of the Asia Pacific regions, mainly through APEC, the ASEAN Russia Dialogue, ERF, and uh, ASEM. Then President <clears throat> Jokowi visited Sochi on 19 to 20 May 2016 to attend the 20th ASEAN Russia Summit. During this meeting with President Putin, both leaders discussed efforts to develop bilateral relations in a more comprehensive manner, particularly in the fields of defense, economic, trade, investment, and tourism. Five MOUs were signed, which include cooperation in the field of defense, national archives, foreign minister archives, culture, as well as IUU fishing. Business people from big five companies, six five companies, met the president to discuss investment potentials. They committed to invest in some mountain to around 20 billion US dollars. And now some of them have been in Indonesia. Similar cooperation in the political field is an excellent level. There has been significant increase in the intensity of contact of mutual visits of high officials of both countries. In addition, cooperation between parliaments was also encouraging with establishment of friendship group of the Regional Com uh, Representative Council of the Republic of Indonesia and the Russian Federation Council in November uh, 2014. <clears throat> Now, towards strategic partnership. <clears throat> Making the 70th diplomatic relations, Indonesia and Russia agreed to alleviate the bilateral relations into strategic partnership this level in the relations between countries. President Vladimir Putin and President Jokowi Dodo have been scheduled to meet this year 
but unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the meeting could not materialize. The strategic partnership will promote more opportunities to reinforce the shared commitments and to broaden levels of cooperation at the highest level. At the moment, <clears throat> there are at least eight regular meetings mechanism that have been ongoing in the form of joint commission, working groups, policy planning, and bilateral consultation, such as bilateral consultation between the Indonesian Foreign Minister for Politics, Law, and Security, and Secretary on the Security Councils of the Russian Federation. Second, Joint Commission on Trade, Economic, and Technic Technical Cooperation between the Office of the Indonesian Foreign Minister of Economic Affairs and Russian Industry and Trade Ministry. Joint Commission on Military Technical Cooperation between the Indonesian Defense Industry and Federal Service for Military Technical Cooperation of Russia. And then bilateral consultation between Regional Representative Council of the Republic of Indonesia and the Federal Council of Russian Federation. Bilateral consultation between Indonesia and Russia Minister of Foreign Affairs on legal basis, human rights, policy planning, and tourism, and also Indonesia-Russia interfaith and intermediate dialogue, intermediate dialogue which uh, last year we organized the uh, second uh, dialogue. The relations between Indonesia and Russia have steadily strengthened as short in the establishment of various platforms of dialogues and mechanisms on politics, economy, finance, defense, and security, tourism, cybersecurity, sister city of province and culture. Indonesia has more dialogues with Russia than in any other European Asian Asian countries. So if we look at this uh, <clears throat> bilateral uh, mechanism or consultations, actually we just small step before the strategic partners. So now it is a matter of when our leaders to leaders will meet and sign uh, the uh, document. <clears throat> Challenges and opportunities. <clears throat> the problem of global environment of the 21st century is more multidimensional and unpredictable. The world is becoming more insecure and facing new threats such as ethno-related conflicts, the rise of radicalization and violent extremism. The pandemic of COVID-19 has created unprecedented challenges to globalization that no country is prepared to face it. Despite having considerably positive side, globalization also brings negative impact on those of coronavirus <coughs> virus. The spread on the virus with uncontrollable manner was also due to the rapid development of people movement thanks to the globalization. The pandemic has also created new phenomenon unthinkable by those who believe in globalization, like a closed border, travel ban, paralyzed supply chains, and export restriction. Many countries, including those who first championed the globalization, are also becoming more protectionist, and certainly this is followed by racial abuses, as if the virus originated from certain nationality. <clears throat> Unfortunately, many recent elections have been won by those candidates who advocate protectionist policy based on narrow-minded nationalism. This in turn promoted strong border control, tariffs, and restriction on immigration. This is actually against the uh, spirit of globalization. Nobody knows when coronavirus will end, but for sure the world will be facing the biggest recessions since the first world war. In facing the pandemic, for example, Indonesia and other members of ASEAN countries prefer cooperation and coordination. Indonesia is encouraging ASEAN countries to closely cooperate in border control and make sure that each member country's policy would not disrupt medical supply chain urgently needed by all members. In the case with Russia, as Alvin said, there has been mutual ignorance on both sides. Many in Indonesia still view Russia as an extension of the Soviet Union with the communist ideology. With majority of Russians still believe that Russia is part of the West, despite the fact that 75% of the, ter the territory lies in Asia. Russia is the 12th biggest economy in the world, Indonesia is the 16th. But if you look at the, our total battle threat, it does not affect our potentials. We are not competitors, we are complement, we complement each other. Russia needs palm oil from Indonesia, for example, 
and Indonesia needs grains from Russia because we don't grow grain, uh, grains. <coughs> Total trade value between Indonesia and Russia based on the data from the Federal Customs in 2019 was 2.45 billion, down 5% from 2018, which reached 2.58 billion. Within ASEAN, Indonesia ranks third after Vietnam, which is the trade partner of Russia, and, and then second Malaysia. But this is actually uh, also a positive sign because uh, 2018, we ranked five after uh, Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia, and Thailand. But now uh, we rank third. Although we learned that all the, except Malaysia, all countries in Asia, in ASEAN, has a negative uh, growth with uh, a trade, trade with uh, Russia. The Indonesian Embassy initiated the Indonesian Festival, or we call it Festival Indonesia, since 2016, and has made it an annual event. The festival is designed to showcase Indonesian products, promote tourism, as well as presentation of culture performance, besides organizing a business forum which could attract business from both sides. The number of Russian tourists visiting Indonesia continues to increase. In 2019, there are almost 160,000 Russian tourists visiting Indonesia, almost double compared to the figure of 2016. And on the other hand, the number of Indonesian tourists visiting Russia increased sixfold, from only around 5,000 to around 30,000. So actually, the festival promotes not only Indonesia in Russia, but Russia in Indonesia. In the field of education, interest among universities of two countries are growing. Several universities in Russia have signed MOUs with their counterparts in Indonesia during the recent years. The number of Indonesian students continue their higher state education in Russia also growing uh, from 329 in 2016 to 649 in 2020, mostly under Russian government scholarship. But also there is a new trend that some of the students studying in Russia uh, based on their own uh, financial uh, capability. Likewise, the Indonesian government regularly grants scholarships for Russian students through arts and culture scholarship and Dharma Sesva, language, art and culture. During the last 10 years, around 177 Russian students have been granted the scholarships. Now, if I would like to conclude, Indonesia and Russia share many similarities as well as common interests. Both countries are built on mutual multiculturalism based on freedom of belief and religion and non-interference principle. The 70th anniversary of the bilateral relations of the two countries is in the right moment to strengthen closer cooperation and step forward to the next level of strategic partnership between the both countries. It is a perfect momentum to enhance more bilateral cooperation in the fields of trade and investment, tourism, defense, and security, education, culture, as well as foster people to people relations in order to promote more understanding between our two great countries. Now, before I uh, finish, I would like to uh, congratulate and to uh, extend my great, greatest uh, appreciation to uh, National Research University of High School of Economics which happened, my son also graduated from this uh, very uh, <clears throat> uh, prominent university in, in Russia. And also to the uh, uh, Institute of Oriental Studies, Russian Academy of Science. So again, I thank you for this opportunity and uh, I'd be happy to have any questions later on. Thank you, Pasiba. Uh, thank you for brilliant presentation. Uh, it was uh, very interesting. I think that your presentation can be a foundation for a huge scientific work. I think it's uh, very interesting and in future, uh, <laughs> on the basis of your uh, presentation, uh, can be prepared different uh, scientific works on Indonesia-Russian relations. So it's a good presentation. Thank you greatly. And now I want to ask uh, uh, 
Alexander Popov for our uh, second participant, our second um, presentation uh, that devoted for military technical cooperation, uh, status and prospects between Indonesia and Russia. So please, Alexander. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, nowadays, the Russian Indonesian military technical cooperation is uh, quite an uh, ordinary process, but it wasn't uh, such a usual one after General Suharto took the power in 1965-67. Uh, in the middle of the 60s, uh, practically the whole cooperation of the two countries in this field was closed down. More than that, a big part of the Soviet armament which was sold or presented to the Indonesian armed uh, forces during the Sukarno time, was scrapped due to unsatisfied service and absence of spare parts. Uh, since that time, the Indonesian armed forces began to use, with certain exceptions, only Western-made armament. But by early 90s, Indonesia uh, began to face difficulties in getting new armament from the Western bloc that accused Indonesia of violating human rights in Eastern Timor, which was occupied by Indonesia with the approval of the USA and some of the Western countries in uh, 1975, after the Portuguese revolution. Indonesia even could not get spare parts for some Western armaments, which were bought before. Uh, in these circumstances, uh, Indonesia had to appeal to other countries for purchasing of new armament, but uh, it wasn't that easy to resume the military cooperation of our countries because during the previous 20 years, the whole military structure of Indonesia was oriented towards the relations with Western Bloc. All the relations between our uh, two countries in military field in practice uh, were cut. Besides that time, the Russian Gener uh, Federation uh, generally was still regarded as Indonesia as a communist country, and the communism has been banned in Indonesia. Uh, the crucial moment in resuming this cooperation was the participation of Russian companies in Indonesian air show 1996. And this is the photo uh, of uh, uh, this event. Uh, please, next. And stop it here. It was the time when Russian companies just began to enter the international market, and it was not easy for them to take decision for that participation, because not many people in Russia believe that Indonesia could become a buyer of Russian equipment. Nevertheless, Rosvoroshenia, the previous name of Rosaboron Export, uh, together with the Suhoi Company, Bromo Flight Research Institute. Uh, Arzamas machine building plant and some other companies uh, took part uh, in uh, Indonesian air show 96 and uh, showed the capabilities uh, of Russian equipment and uh, first of all of the best Russian fighter Sukhoi 27. Both the Indonesian public military circles and President Suharto himself could see brilliant technical capabilities of the Russian aircraft but still, it was not enough for resuming our military cooperation because some party should make a first step. Uh, next, please. Uh, next, please. And uh, such a step was made by Russia when on the 26th of February 1997, the head of Ross Orogeny, Alexander Katyokin, and the assistant of the Russian president for the military technical cooperation, Boris Kuzik, brought to President Suharto a proposal of Russia to resume this cooperation. Since that uh, moment, the relations between our countries began to develop very rapidly. Uh, many Indonesian delegations uh, visited uh, Russia for negotiations on armament purchases. Next, please. Uh, quite a big role in that process was uh, played by the father of Indonesian aviation, the Ministry for Research and Technology, Professor Hadithi. And uh, within several months, our countries uh, made a progress worth of many years. And already in early August 1997, the Indonesian government took a decision of purchasing uh, Russian fighters, Sukhoi 27 and helicopters MI-17. Next, please. Uh, next, uh, this uh, decision 
uh, was announced on the 5th of August 1997 in Jakarta by the Minister of National Planning in Jakarta Sasmita. And already by the end of August, uh, both parties uh, succeeded next, uh, to sign the contract of this uh, purchase. Unfortunately, by that time, a terrible economic financial crisis began to develop in Southeast Asia in general and in Indonesia particularly. And uh, due to that uh, crisis, Indonesia had to uh, postpone the purchase of Russian armament. And at the same time, Indonesia had to give up the production of its own aircraft M250, which was established in 1995 by the team of Professor Habib. Next, please. After the collapse of the new order regime, the Indonesian economy quite rapidly recovered from the economic crisis, and both parties continued contacts on uh, that delayed issue. And in uh, 2001, a small quantity of uh, that is uh, 1,300 pieces of Russian regenerative machine gun Kalashnikov was purchased for the Indonesian police. And nearly at the same time, uh, both, parties, uh, both parties achieved an agreement on 12 armored carriers BTR 80A that was also presented by Russia at uh, Indonesian Air Show 96. That equipment was sent to Indonesia at the end of 2002. And according to the head of Indonesian Navy at that time, Admiral Werner Ken Sondak, the price of each BTR 80A was 550,000 US dollars only. It was already time, uh, next please, uh, when uh, Megawati Sukarno Putri came to power and she wished uh, to raise the military technical cooperation of the two countries to the level which existed when her father was the president of Indonesia. Uh, next, please. And uh, when in April 2003 uh, she came to Moscow with a state visit, uh, she came with the decision to buy the best Russian fighters Sukhoi. This mission was entrusted to her best friend, that time Rini Suwandi, who was the Minister of Industry and Trade. And uh, as the operator from Indonesia site was chosen Bulok, a state agency which uh, must secure the reserves of main food products. That choice was caused by the fact that the Indonesian side would like to arrange this deal partly on a barter basis, as it was also planned in uh, 1997. Uh, next, please. Uh, such a combination, uh, uh, such a combination of main players uh, in that game, caused some uh, kind of jealousy from the Indonesian armed forces, though their chief commander. General Sutarto Indirartono was in Moscow during the visit of Megawati and participated in some negotiations, which actually were very difficult and continued for some days and nights. And only when Megawati left Moscow for Poland, the agreement was signed by Bulok and Rosa Baronescu. According to Rini Suvandi, Indonesia had to pay only 12.5% uh, of the whole amount of the contract as a down payment, and the rest, 87.5%, uh, should be paid gradually during 18 months by traditional Indonesian commodities, mainly by uh, palm oil. It was quite a favorable, favorable deal for Indonesia, especially in the conditions of uh, continued USA embargo for armament sales. Uh, nevertheless, uh, both Megawati and Barini Suwandi were strongly criticized in Indonesia, first of all, for violating of the defense law, which demands that such uh, agreements to be signed with the approval of the parliament and the users, and the user, uh, that is the Indonesian air forces. And uh, their chief, uh, Chepi Hakim, was quoted to declare uh, the refusal of buying Sukhoi fighters, which according to him, were of bad quality. Besides the Indonesian national budget, uh, 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 there were not special allocations for the payment for palm oil being used in that part of scheme. And the whole amount of the contract estimated as much as 193 million US dollars 
And it was the special price for Indonesia for two Sukhoi 27, uh, two Sukhoi 30, and uh, two helicopters MI 35. Definitely, that deal was done by guerrilla means and was not agreed properly by the Indonesian Ministry of Defense, Indonesian Air Forces, Indonesian Ministry of Finance, and the Parliament, and quite often was called in Indonesia as Sukhoi Gate. In any case, already in October 2003, when Indonesia paid only around 20% of the above mentioned amount, the Russian aircraft began to be delivered to Madiun, this job. And Indonesia got it, uh, its first Sukhoi jets, and uh, it was a real breakthrough in our military cooperation. Since that time, Sukhoi jets are regarded by Indonesian air forces as the core of their armaments. And it was a real achievement of Megawati and Rini Suwandi, though the deal was not done in accordance with certain rules. In 2004, Megawati lost the presidential elections and her successor, and her former uh, minister Susila Bambang Yudhoyono, continued her policy of military technical cooperation with Russia. And Russia did everything to help Indonesia to increase uh, its purchases from, of Russian armament by providing Indonesia with a state credit worth of one billion US dollar for these uh, purposes. Next, please. It is interesting uh, that the negotiations on this matter from Indonesian side uh, were begun by uh, General Secretary of uh, uh, Ministry of Defense, Jafri Shamsuddin, who at the end of last year became a special assistant of the new Minister of Defense, Prabowo Subyanto. In practice, uh, that uh, credit was agreed on the 1st of December 2006 during the state uh, visit of uh, Susila Bambang Yudhoyono to Moscow. Both parties agreed that the state credit will be used for financing of Indonesian purchases of Sukhoi aircrafts, military helicopters, uh, small tanks BMP-3, avionics, simulator for Sukhoi, and uh, uh, first of all, diesel submarine Kilo Plus. The conditions of Russian state credit were much favorable for Indonesia than those of usual uh, export credits, which usually used for military purchases. But uh, this money should not come to Indonesia and must be used inside Russia for the payment of armament production. Unfortunately, the whole amount of the state credit was not used by Indonesian side. Uh, 219 million were used for purchasing of the helicopters, uh, 60 million for the MP3, and uh, 80 million for avionics, simulator, and spare parts. Actually, seven, around 700 million US dollars were supposed for submarine kilo class, but Indonesia at last bought them, uh, bought uh, submarines in South Korea, and the two pieces of submarines Jambobo were delivered to Indonesia last year. But the performance of these submarines made by Deu didn't satisfy the Indonesian side that was quite openly declared by the uh, Minister, of, uh, Minister of Defense, Prabowo Sudyan. Next, please. Nevertheless, in August uh, 2007, a new contract for Sukhoi was signed, was, was signed and uh, during 2009 and 2010, Three Sukhoi 27 SKM and the three Sukhoi uh, 30 MK2 were received by Indonesia. Under the state credit, Indonesia bought uh, six MI 17 and uh, three more MI 35. So by the end of 2011, Indonesia uh, has already had uh, 10 Sukhoi. Uh, next, uh, two Sukhoi 27. SK, three Sukhoi uh, 27 SKM, two Sukhoi 30 MK, and three Sukhoi uh, 30 MK2. Our cooperation in military field was not limited by purchases of armaments only. Next, please. Uh, there were also some visits of uh, Russian military ships to Indonesia. Uh, next, please. And uh, during one of them, at the end of May 2011, uh, two ships of Russian uh, Pacific fleet came to Makassar and uh, Russian Marines and their Indonesian counterparts called joint anti-pirates exercises. 
Next, please. Uh, Russian pilots and technicians helped their Indonesian uh, colleagues to master Russian aircrafts and helicopters, both in Indonesia and in Russia. Many Indonesian military specialists visited Russian plants to examine the production of military equipment for their countries. Next, please. Uh, in short, uh, during uh, the next presidency, uh, uh, in short, during the presidency of uh, SBR, our military cooperation was developing quite successfully. And on the 29th uh, December 2011, another contract for six Sukhoi uh, 30 MK2 worth of uh, 470 million US dollars was signed. And these aircrafts were delivered to Indonesia in 2013-2014. Next, please. Uh, besides, in January 2014, uh, 37 pieces of uh, BMP-3 were handed over to Indonesian Marines uh, in Situ Bondo, East Java. Next, please. Uh, thus, by the first uh, presidency of Joko Widodo, Indonesia has already had one squadron of Sukhoi fighters, though not all of them were in a satisfied technical conditions. Uh, and uh, what happened now in cooperation since the end of uh, 2014? During the first presidency of Joko Widodo, uh, Moscow was many times visited by Minister of Defense, Riemizar Triakudu, the Chief of Indonesian uh, Armed Forces, Gatot Nurmantiu, and many other delegations uh, which continued negotiations of new purchases of Russian armaments, specifically amphibian aircraft Beria 200, the world's largest helicopter MI-2062, some anti-aircraft systems, and certainly the most modern Sukhoi fighter of the new generation, Sukhoi 35. And on the 14th February 2018, the parties signed an agreement on purchases by Indonesia of 11 Sukhoi 35 uh, for 1 billion point uh, 15 uh, million uh, US dollars. And for half of this amount, Russia has to buy different commodities of traditional Indonesian export. Besides uh, this agreement, includes so-called offset program, which supposes some Russian investments in creating a service center for Sukhoi in Indonesia. Two more years have already passed, but since the time of this agreement signing, and we don't see any implementation of it. The real reason is so-called American Katsa, or America's adversaries through sanctions that was signed by President Trump in August 2017. That is around half a year before our new big contract was signed in Jakarta. Since August uh, 2017, it was obvious that the countries buying Russian armaments would face American economic sanctions. And it was understood very well by Indonesian financial authorities, which cut all possible transactions from Indonesian banks to Russian companies, which were already under American sanctions, like Rosoborn Export, Russian helicopters, and some others. What made it very difficult to carry, to carry out even small contracts signed before cuts. So right now, the Indonesian government uh, must take a very difficult decision on the contract with Russia concerning possible American sanctions. First of all, the Indonesian export can be jeopardized if the USA start using import taxes for Indonesian goods and the export to the USA is much, much more important for Indonesia than that to Russia. Just a few figures of, that, of the export of main Indonesian commodities in 2019. Palm oil to the USA. 658.6 million US dollars and 358.5 million dollars to Russia. Coffee, 254 million dollars to the States and 17.3 million dollars to Russia. Frozen shrimps, 854.4 million dollars to 
uh, states and uh, just two uh, million uh, point two uh, to Russia uh, closes 4.3 billion US dollars to the states and just 33 million to Russia footwear 1.4 uh, billion to states and 38 million to Russia etc etc Certainly, if there are import taxes or additional barriers for these commodities, uh, this uh, export to the USA will for sure be reduced. In threatening other countries which would like to buy Russian armament, the USA demonstrated a policy of international dictatorship trying to impose their own arms. In case of our current big contract of Sukhoi, the USA would like to suggest to Indonesia not the most modern fighter F-35, but uh, an old model uh, F-16 Viper. I should also mention that since cut, uh, cuts was announced, there were some countries which continued military cooperation, uh, purchasing Russian uh, equipment and ignored cuts. First of all, Turkey, the member of NATO, which bought four battalions of uh, S-400, Though there were certainly threats from, from America. One more regiment of uh, uh, S-400 400 was received in December 2019 by China. The same armament is continued to be bought by India. At the beginning of 2019, Vietnam received 64 tanks uh, T-90S. And uh, since the middle of uh, 2018, Iraq was receiving the MP3, which total number by 2022 will be 500 pieces. And another point which, in my opinion, should be taken into consideration by the Indonesian government is the American embargo on selling armament, which was already applied to Indonesia in 1990s. If and only if the president of Indonesia takes a decision pro Sukhoi, the crucial point for both parties will be how to arrange payments in order to avoid obstacles of Western banks. In this uh, case, firstly, we can return to barter scheme, which was used in the uh, first Congress. Uh, certain trade companies would get the payment uh, to the Russian seller in the form of Indonesian commodities for selling them both in Russian and international market. But we can also return to universal means of payment, I mean gold. And in this case, we will need no banks, no hard currency. The buyer, let's say uh, Ministry of Defense, would buy gold from Antam, Indonesian state uh, company, by Rupia. The gold would be taken to Russia by Russian uh, aircraft and placed in the central bank that will pay that will pay in Russia in rubles to the seller for the production of Sukhoi or some other military equipment. So if America doesn't want its dollars to be used as means of payment, we can avoid them. We believe that our governments, uh, please, uh, next please, will find a, a solution suitable for both parties. And in this case, we very much hope for the role of the new Minister of Defense of Indonesia, Prabowo Subianto, who has recently visited Russia and uh, had corresponding negotiations with the Russian authorities. And uh, to look in the future, we must consider a more stable cooperation based on a joint production of military equipment and transfer of technology. In this case, Russian armaments produced in a joint plant on the territory of Indonesia will be regarded as a national product of Indonesia and automatically will have a priority if there are purchases for the national army and police. But uh, certainly even in this case, there will be no guarantee of absence uh, of American sanctions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Great, Alexander, for your brilliant and very detailed uh, presentation. Uh, yes, and now we'll go to another presentation uh, from Yekaterina Koltunova from um, Gimor. And her presentation.
presentation, the title of her presentation is Indonesian Vector of Relations between Russia and ASEAN, Opportunities, Limitations and uh, Prospects. So please, Ekaterina, we are waiting and we will be listening to your presentation. Good afternoon to everyone and it's good to well, see uh, virtually speaking every uh, participant of this uh, very important uh, conference and it's good that uh, despite of uh, coronavirus and uh, the current uh, restrictions we still can meet and uh, discuss what is going on going on in our bilateral relations of course it is also clear that uh, there are serious limitations imposed by the shutdown of uh, uh, infrastructural connections between the countries and for Russia and Southeast Asia and for Russia and Indonesia this is particularly important because we don't have uh, land uh, connections we have all, only uh, connections by the air flights which are not functioning right now so uh, certainly there will be uh, a pose in the direct contacts, including the contacts at the highest level. But the academic communities can still meet thanks to the new technologies. We still can think about what will be going on after the pandemic hopefully will be over. And uh, for this reason, I uh, would like to say a huge thanks to the High School of Economics, to the Institute of Oriental Studies for um, not losing pace in our uh, contacts with our Indonesian colleagues and friends. So the topic of my presentation will be about the role of Indonesia or Indonesian vector of ASEAN Russia relations uh, what uh, are the opportunities, what are the prospects, what are the stumbling blocks. Though one of the stumbling blocks was very well uh, explained and laid out by Dr. Alexander Popov in his presentation uh, before my talk. And my view on these problems will be slightly different vis-a-vis uh, -vis those of Dr. Popov and uh, his Excellency Vahid Supriyadi, uh, because I will try to fit in Russia-Indonesia's relations into a broader picture of ASEAN-Russia relations. Uh, the next slide, please. So, we all know that in November 2018, ASEAN-Russia dialogue partnership was elevated to the level of strategic partnership, and by that moment, among all ASEAN member states, Russia had strategic partnership only with Vietnam, comprehensive strategic partnership. And this case will be uh, elaborated in more details by the next speaker, as I may uh, assume from, uh, from the program. Uh, for quite a while, at the same time, uh, there has been a debate at the political and academic levels uh, concerning the possibilities of elaborating, of uh, elevating Russia-Indonesia relations to a level of strategic partnership. And this talk uh, had to result logically in this year events, and we all were waiting for the developments at the highest political level, because uh, there were two concurring invitations uh, going to and coming to President Putin from the Indonesian side, and to uh, Indonesian president from uh, from the Russian president. So, uh, but uh, obviously, coronavirus is not uh, uh, the one which will let uh, these meetings uh, take place in the in the near future. And uh, definitely, there will be a certain pause uh, in in the development at the highest political level. Um, Indonesia is indeed a key member state of ASEAN. Uh, it is one of the founding members. It is home to ASEAN Secretariat in Jakarta. And of course, um, uh, it, it would be logical to have strategic partnership with Indonesia, uh, having strategic partnership uh, between 
SN in brochure. To understand better the function and importance of Indonesia to SN Russia relations, we need, however, to look closer at the logic uh, which brought ASEAN and Russia to the level of strategic partnership. Uh, the next slide, please. Before I proceed to this logic as I uh, see it personally, and I would not claim that that's the only right way to explain uh, the reasons and the logic of ASEAN Russia partnership. Um, I would like to pay your attention to the results of the State of Southeast Asia 2020 survey report, which is nicely done yearly by Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore. And uh, to the question about the uh, top three concerns about ASEAN among experts, because this survey is done not uh, among the uh, broad public, it is done uh, targetedly and focused on the opinion of the expert community. So these people do indicate three most important uh, concerns. Number one is that ASEAN's tangible benefits uh, will not be felt by people, so that's the chief concern, and Russia uh, cannot uh, very much help in this respect. But the second chief concern is that ASEAN is becoming an arena of major power competition. So um, uh, there were opportunities to uh, take several answers to this question. That's why you see that uh, the first and the second concerns have a uh, quite close uh, amount of um, respondents uh, answered, who answered positively. So uh, this is the point where uh, Russia come in, because um, as we will see further on, uh, for ASEAN it is indeed important to have, um, to be able not to uh, ban just one uh, or two partners, but to have more participants uh, actively uh, visible in the region. And then uh, number three concern is that ASEAN is unable to cope with fluid political and economic developments. We all may uh, think what, uh, what, what does it mean? ASEAN uh, becomes uh, an object of uh, US-China competition. ASEAN becomes an object of what Dr. Popov has recently exposed, uh, influences in the sanctions front, uh, so many, uh, many different uh, things are coming in this, uh, in this section. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, so uh, what is, in my opinion, uh, the logic behind uh, the ASEAN-Russia strategic partnership? I think that there are certain functions uh, quite visible, which Russia fulfill for ASEAN and ASEAN uh, fulfills for uh, Russia. And uh, these functions uh, actually brought to, uh, to partners to the strategic partnership uh, elevation. As for Russia, uh, we all can uh, see that uh, this is uh, an additional, mainly geopolitical, not a geoeconomic actor, unfortunately. We would love to see greater Russia's geoeconomic role, but it's not uh, fully there, uh, despite many uh, efforts. But geopolitically, it is important uh, to have uh, one more actor uh, which, which will add colors to the picture, if I may say so. Secondly, this is not a confrontational force. Despite many in the region uh, expected that Russia will bring more troubles uh, to the region, specifically the countries which had and still have uh, long-lasting uh, alliances, military alliances with the United States. Uh, certain uh, Filipino colleagues were uh, lamenting that you see that uh, you are so uh, confrontational with the, in, in your relations with the uh, US, you will bring it to the region. But I uh, personally, I might be wrong here, I personally do not see that uh, Russia brings this confrontation to ASEAN in the way uh, U.S. and China bring their uh, uh, contradictions to the region. Then number three function is, of course, an alternative for military technical cooperation. And the case of Indonesia is very visible here. Um, 
we had quite recently a meeting with a young colleague uh, or relatively young colleague from Habibi Center uh, and Dr. Knaif uh, and Dr. Popov uh, were present. Um, so uh, he reminded us about 1980s, then the US denied uh, uh, its military or limited its uh, military support to Indonesia and thus Indonesia turned to uh, broader military technical cooperation with, uh, with Russia. Um, so uh, number four uh, function is the alternative for technological cooperation in times of possible US-China decoupling. So uh, as we uh, may see and as I may judge from uh, the talks with the embassy, this IT cooperation and uh, the uh, counter cyber terrorism uh, function might be a good uh, vehicle for uh, develop further development of ASEAN uh, Russia and Indonesia Russia relations. As for ASEAN's functions for Russia, uh, of course, we must uh, mention here that ASEAN is the central actor in the regional institutional network. And despite its uh, uh, certain limitations, still, this is one of the chief uh, counterpart uh, once we need to uh, deal with the institutional structure. Indeed, the multilateralism faces certain challenges. Some uh, would even claim that it's in times of crisis and we will see everything downgraded to just bilateral uh, interactions. But in my perspective, the world and the region has come to such point of complexity when we will not be able to cope with these complexity challenges just bilaterally. We will need uh, this multilateralism, though in a transformed uh, form of it. And here ASEAN uh, may, may not be you know, so weakened as um, some experts will, will claim, and it will be able to retain a certain importance to, uh, to the uh, solution of regional or facing regional issues. Uh, number two function of ASEAN for us is that ASEAN, despite many uh, problems arising from the uh, international sanctions, uh, US sanctions in particular, still is a neutral or rather neutral partner, not officially a part of sanctions against Russia. And it's always good to talk to people who are not biased, uh, ideologically biased, and uh, to to discuss what can be done, not uh, uh, what to blame you about, but what can be done uh, in our relation. Number three function is that for Russia, ASEAN is also an alternative, at least formally, for Russia's pivot to China. Uh, sorry for making it uh, that straightforward, because of course there are nuances, but still relations with ASEAN and uh, its positive development in times of uh, many international and regional turbulences, of course, is an indicator that um, uh, Russia can uh, and is able to, to have more alternatives than just China. The other question, of course, is that how easy for us is to deal with Southeast Asia vis-a-vis -vis China, but that's a complicated uh, question. We may discuss it further. A number uh, four will have function is, of course, a hope for closer economic links with uh, between Southeast Asia and Eurasian Economic Union. But that's uh, a very nascent uh, function. Hopefully, it will develop along the development of the uh, institutional settings of the Eurasian Economic Union itself. Uh, does Indonesia fit the logic? So can, uh, uh, can we uh, somehow uh, bring Indonesia in this picture. Um, I would say here that uh, if we follow with this, uh, this particular logic, uh, there are certain troubling uh, points because I referred to the same uh, survey. I found the question about uh, broadening of ASEAN strategic options. So there were several options, which country or uh, regional bloc would you love to uh, turn to in search for broader uh, broader uh, options? And only 3.4% of Indonesians 
believe that closer cooperation with Russia can broaden ASEAN's strategic options. I think that uh, if Indonesians were asked about, Indonesian experts were asked about uh, broadening uh, Indonesia's uh, strategic option, then uh, probably this uh, percentage would be roughly at the same level. But that's, of course, an extrapolation. For a comparison, uh, just to be, uh, uh, well, objective, for the sake to be objective, in our uh, strategic partner Vietnam, 6.6% of experts said that uh, Russia might be a strategic option for, uh, for ASEAN. And uh, on a brighter side, in Myanmar, 10% opted for Russia, in Lao PDR, 26% opted for this option. Uh, which partners do Indonesia see favorably for ASEAN? Uh, Japan and the European Union. And not uh, India, not Australia, not New Zealand, not Republic of Korea at the same level. So uh, if we take the same functions, which I enumerated for ASEAN, I think that indeed Indonesia uh, would agree that Russia is a non-confrontational force in the region. Generally, probably the answer would be yes. But the information gap, these stereotypes are still there from both sides. And His Excellency Ambassador mentioned that, uh, well, uh, it's uh, two-way ignorance. Uh, whatever different uh, situation we experts uh, would love to see. Then uh, military technical cooperation is under question. We had uh, a very detailed and in-depth and insightful talk uh, from Dr. Popov right now. Uh, alternatives for a technological uh, uh, decoupling problem. Here I see a certain uh, potential, but that's up to the specialists to, to say whatever huge this potential is. So just to uh, sum up here and to finalize my talk, I think that uh, Probably thanks to the current pandemic, we have some time to sit and think uh, more closely what we can do, what are the options, and what is to be the uh, future of Indonesian and Russia relations after we uh, commemorate this uh, nice and uh, very uh, important date of 70th anniversary. So that's it. I will stop here and uh, would be thankful for any comments or questions in the discussion section. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ekaterina. It was very interesting uh, presentation. And I think we'll have opportunity to discuss uh, the main points of your presentation during our discussion. But now I will ask our next participant to make uh, his uh, presentation. It's Mikhail Tevskih from Minister of Foreign Affairs. And the title of his presentation is Russia-Vietnam Comprehensive Strategic Partnership, Lessons from Russia-Indonesia Relations. So please. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to this round table. My name is Mikhail Truskich, and um, I have had been working in the Russian Embassy in uh, Vietnam for the last six and a half years. And I would like to try to answer the question, what is strategic partnership based on Russian-Vietnamese relations? Uh, but today I would like to speak not as a diplomat, but as a scientist, if of course I can call myself a, self a scientist. Uh, so this report doesn't represent the position of the ministry, just my uh, personal point of view. Next, please. Uh, I will start briefly with the history of the Russian Vietnamese relations, then mainly focus on the basic characteristics of them today, and proceed with comparison with the Russian Indonesian relations. These, can you please space, please? Uh, this, I hope, will help to answer the main question. Next, yeah, what is strategic partnership? Next, please. So uh, the Soviet Union and Vietnam established diplomatic relations on January 1950. During the Cold War, Vietnam was a member of the Soviet bloc. So USSR helped Vietnam during the struggle for independence and unity uh, in the first and second Indochina wars, especially as you know, in during the US aggression and during the national construction after them. 
1978, the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation was signed and Vietnam joined the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance. During the Cold War, relations between the countries were, were even deeper than strategic partnership in some spheres as we were allies. But uh, it wasn't a true partnership between two equal partners, of course. Then um, the Soviet Union dissolved and countries had to start everything just almost from the beginning. In uh, 1994, um, we have signed an agreement uh, on basic principles of friendly relations, 2001 Declaration on Strategic Partnership and 2012 Declaration on Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. Next, please. Uh, so, talking about the current situation, I would like to start from the intensive political dialogue. For example, during the last three years, we had visits of all decision makers, our president, our prime minister, the chairman of both chambers of parliament, heads of main ministries, and so on. The same can be said about uh, the Vietnamese leaders too. Um, Moscow and Hanoi share a similar view on the global agenda, support the primacy of international law, sovereignty, the idea of polycentric world, world order, and so on. Uh, their interests in Asia-Pacific are also mostly converging. In the context of uh, rising US-China tensions, Vietnam is interested in increasing participation of Russia in the regional affairs as a third party. And a good example of it is Vietnamese support for Russia's joining uh, Asia-Europe Asia meeting, uh, East Asian Summit, and ADMM Plus. Uh, next, please. The captain's spheres of cooperation, uh, sphere of cooperation is oil and gas. The joint company Vietsov Petra, established in uh, 1981, provides almost one third of the oil production in Vietnam. Joint projects with Gazprom, Rosneft, Zerubeshneft provide two thirds of gas production. At the same time, there are mineral projects uh, in, on the territory of Russia, Rus, Viet, Petra, and Gazprom, who success, which successfully work. And uh, Moscow and Hanoi continue to expand the cooperation into the new areas, uh, for example, gas fired power plants, liquefied natural gas, and so on. Next, please. Well, trade is probably the main weak point of Russia, Russian Vietnamese cooperation. In 2016, the FTA between Vietnam and Eurasian Economic Union was signed, and it helped to increase the uh, trade turnover to more than 6 billion in uh, 2018. But in but last year, uh, there was a 20% setback. Uh, an interesting thing is that Vietnamese investments to Russia are bigger than Russian investments to Vietnam. 1 billion and 3 billion. And as Western sanctions are quite sensitive for Russian business abroad at all, two countries uh, percept the use of uh, national currencies as a priority. And the first step in this sphere was made in October last year, where it was a launch of a uh, mere payment system in Vietnam. So it's uh, well, one of the first step of uh, making able to uh, use mere uh, plastic cards, bank cards in Vietnam. Next, please. Uh, bright sports of the cooperation in the sphere of science and technology are uh, the joint tropical center that successfully works from Soviet times and the construction of center for nuclear and science technology. Of course, everyone heard about ties between armed forces, uh, which are one of the main pillars of our relations. It is not only about the supply of uh, military equipment, but also about uh, education and training. The new promising sphere is ICT. For example, the Vietnamese Cybersecurity Center was built with the help of Kaspersky Lab, and Hanoi is interested in Moscow's experience in smart cities. Also, there is direct cooperation between national security agencies that shows trust based character of the relations at all. Next, please. So, if you look at the people-to-people -people relations, first we need to mention uh, 70,000 alumni of Soviet and Russian universities. Uh, today, Russia provides almost 1,000 grants for Vietnamese students, and the total number of Vietnamese students in Russia are about, uh, is about 6,000. 
Um, if we talk about, well, if, if we talk about times before the COVID pandemic, there were direct flights between every day, which helped to achieve number of uh, 600,000 Russian and 70,000 Vietnamese tourists each year. A good practice is a regular mutual help in cases of national disasters. All these factors contributed to the fact that Vietnam is number one in the world in terms of favorable attitude to Russia, according to the Pew Research Center. Next, please. So, if we compare these features, the features above the, uh, the Russian Danish relations, we will find quite a number of similarities. First of all, the history of ties uh, and the Soviet help uh, in this history. Quite a similar views on the global agenda and converging interest in the region. Uh, the fact that st uh, government owned corporations, Russian corporations, are anchors, and at the same time, uh, both relations are lacking ties between small and medium enterprises. We've got quite a similar mechanism of cooperation, I mean, like uh, intergovernmental commissions and so on. And uh, um, Quite, uh, quite the same promising spheres. It's, it's cooperation with the Eurasian Economic Union and nuclear energy. Next, please. So, uh, as you can see, there are quite a number of similarities. Uh, but uh, in the most of the spheres, Vietnam is at least a small step ahead. Uh, at the same time, this comparison is not really correct because we need to compare relations with Vietnam not, not as of today, but 20 years ago, uh, before the establishment of strategic partnership. If we do so, we'll realize that Russian-Indonesian ties have already achieved the level of cooperation between Russia and Vietnam on the eve of strategic partnership. Uh, so does it mean that strategic partnership is just a big talk? Well, I don't think so. Next, please. Different countries have different names for privileged partnerships. We can combine them uh, in this way. Comprehensive partnership, a sectoral strategic partnership, when strategic partnership is established in some spheres, for example, strategic partnership in, in medicine, I know, uh, strategic partnership, and well, let, it call, let us call it strategic partnership plus, for example, comprehensive strategic partnership. Um, sometimes this systematization can confuse. For example, Russia had, has relations of strategic partnership plus, plus with India and China, while relations between B, um, yeah, with India, China, and Vietnam, if we talk about Asia Pacific. And Vietnam also has uh, relations of strategic partnership plus with India and China, while the relations between Beijing and Hanoi uh, sometimes are on the edge of the conflict because of the uh, South China Sea problem. At the same time, relations between Vietnam and the US are officially called the comprehensive partnership. So just the first step. So as we can see, in fact, the status of a strategic partnership depends on many factors, on history, uh, real state of relations, of course, uh, political motivation, even personal relations between the leaders. Next, please. So uh, to sum up, we can figure out some uh, conclusions. Um, there are not any strict criteria of strategic partnership, even it's quite difficult to find a definition of it. Uh, but at the same time, to establish the strategic partnership, countries should share long-term mutual interests and some joint projects. Uh, they should have a regular high-level political dialogue because, well, it's, uh, these agreements are uh, signed by the leaders and they sh should meet. Uh, decision makers should be confident that right after the establishment of a strategic partnership, there will be no setbacks in the relations, otherwise it will throw a shadow on the policymakers. And probably the most important one, um, that strategic partnership is not just an achievement itself. It shows that countries have a mutual desire and real prospects to deepen the relations. Yeah, and probably that is all that I wanted to, uh, to share with you. Next, please. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll be glad to answer your questions. Thank you greatly uh, for your brilliant presentation. It was very interesting, the comparison between uh, Vietnam and Indonesia. 
um, in their relations with Russia. I, I think it's a very interesting topic and uh, it's, it's a very interesting question. Who is before? Uh, who is going ahead? Uh, Vietnam or Indonesia? Because uh, there are some uh, different topics on relations with China. You see, it's a very huge problem here. So now I can uh, tell you that we have another participant, Alexey Yurich Drugov, a uh, veteran of uh, studying uh, Russia-Indonesian relation, a prominent scholar. He prepared uh, his uh, presentation, but now he is not be able to take part. And I want to tell you that his presentation on military technical cooperation between Russia and Indonesia will be added to our presentations. And then when we'll form uh, the uh, all amount of uh, presentations, I think uh, there will be uh, his presentation also. And then I want to tell you that the first part of our uh, conference is over. And I think now we can uh, begin our discussion. And I want to ask uh, our participant uh, to take part in this discussion, to ask questions or make some uh, commentaries on uh, the presentation that we learned. So thank you. Who will begin? Who want to ask uh, our participants? Uh, about their presentations. So let's begin our discussion. So no one, but I think I have some uh, questions. I... <laughs> Mr. Lentinovich, sorry. Uh, I, I sent uh, my question to our collective chat. Uh, can I oh, ask yes. uh, several questions? And uh, before I do it, my heartfelt gratitude uh, to Mikhail Tersky for a very interesting and uh, insightful and intellectually stimulating presentation. And I suppose uh, that the topics uh, that uh, have been raised in his presentation are possibly central for our uh, today's discussion for a very simple reason. In case we assume that the formulation strategic partnership means something something tangible, something focused, something practically oriented. Uh, uh, another logical question come, comes to mind. Uh, what are the key criteria of this phenomenon? And uh, uh, Mikhail has uh, absolutely rightfully distinguished uh, between uh, several forms of strategic partnerships. Uh, uh, um, and uh, as we know, uh, Russia and Vietnam have a special relationship of a comprehensive strategic partnership, while India and Russia have a highly privileged strategic partnership, etc. But uh, my first question, which goes not only to Mikhail, but also to the rest of the audience, is very simple. Strategic, the adjective strategic means something important and something long lasting. Otherwise, it wouldn't be strategic, right? And uh, speaking about the Vietnamese perspective of uh, this phenomenon, the strategic partnership, I want to remind you that uh, Vietnam has this type of relationship, I mean strategic partnerships with Italy and Spain. And uh, Misha, in your opinion, is it just a slogan of the day? I mean, the formulation of strategic partnership with relevance to Vietnam's relations with uh, Spain and Italy, or possibly Vietnam has, well, some strategic issues, some strategic tasks to resolve in relations with these countries. Is it really so that Vietnam resolves some tasks of strategic significance in its relations with Italy and Spain. What do you think about it? Well, uh, as I said quite often, uh, this status of strategic partnership is just big talk, for example, uh, and uh, in fact, not necessarily strategic partnership uh, really shows that uh, relations between the countries are strategically oriented. Uh, for example, if we talk about criteria, as I thought, uh, as I said, it's uh, quite difficult to find any of them, but probably the main of them are just that countries are not in a state of war and uh, they're thinking about uh, future relations between them. 
and uh, it is true, uh, for example, in the case of relations uh, between Vietnam and Italy and Spain. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I do agree that uh, today the, this term strategic partnership is, is too blurred and it's quite difficult to find out what it is and how it really works. And sometimes it can, well, it can may uh, it can really confuse and uh, even make problems then to, to to the country's relations then to help them. Uh, Dmitry Valentinovich, and what is your opinion about it? I mean the very phenomenon, the very formulation of strategic partnerships, because this is something really obliging. This is something demanding uh, a kind of special relationship otherwise these relations wouldn't be strategic and uh, um, uh, here we see that not strategic partnerships well really perform strategic tasks or are not really intended to perform strategic tasks yes it's a very interesting question uh, it's a practical question in fact because i think that uh, it's always strategic comprehensive strategic cooperation it depends on current situation, current political situation. And we can see many examples when countries, they don't have any strategic uh, cooperation, they don't have any strategic uh, tasks, but in a situation changing, and in a changing situation, they suddenly realize that they have common interests and they do uh, their, uh, their policy together without any words of strategic cooperation. So I think it's uh, the problem of uh, current relations because, for example, there, were period, uh, there was a period of time when Russia and Vietnam really had strategic cooperation. And we could see this cooperation in 1979, for example, and in other uh, conflicts when uh, Soviet Union and Vietnam, it was real strategic cooperation, common uh, purposes in economic uh, sphere, in political sphere, and in understanding of uh, the international process. But now I think in, in Asia and in relation between Asian countries, it's uh, some kind, some words, it's uh, oblig obligatory words. Because when you have good relations, when you have sympathy to one country or to another country, and when you sign some agreements, it's very good to say that you have strategic cooperation. And I think that uh, the value, the value of these words now is highly diminished because we can see some other countries that really they don't have strategic cooperation. They have their tactical tasks or they have something that connected with the current political situation. With no, without any, as you uh, said very right, that strategic cooperation is a long-term cooperation, it's long-term tasks, a common understanding of international process for a long, long period. But now I think there are words of strategic cooperations and there is uh, real politics, real politics that connected with the current political situation. You can see during this pandemic crisis that this political situation is changing very quickly. <laughs> and so we can see uh, that uh, it's changing very quickly. And I think very soon will be stopped uh, before very difficult questions because uh, the contradictions that were not very high before the pandemic crisis, now we can see even in the South China Sea in other regions, we can see uh, that this contradiction now is very acute, is very acute and uh, very soon we'll have uh, to see uh, the obstacles for uh, global development because of all these uh, contradictions connected with the pandemic crisis that stimulated these uh, contradictions. And we can see it in different examples. So that's why I think that uh, we don't have uh, to uh, think about words. We don't. We have to analyze real politics. And we'll, if we'll analyze real politics, for example, Vietnam, we'll see that the relations of Vietnam with the United States is very close to comprehensive strategic partnership on the highest level. You see, but in fact, in Vietnam, they don't use these words. And at the same time, we, we, we can speak about strategic. A comprehensive cooperation between Vietnam and uh, China, 
So it's a question. It's a question uh, on what level now we can see this cooperation. So that's why I think that uh, Russia with Indonesia, we can have very good relations. We have, have we can have strategic cooperation because we have common view on different international problems and we have common goals for uh, future of the world is peaceful cooperation friendship and so so on and that's why it's a foundation it's a solid basis for uh, our future cooperation with indonesia and for developing our relations and i think about maybe uh, we'll go up uh, to russian vietnam relations the economic sphere i think it will be very effective thing because the example of a common market between Vietnam and uh, Russia because there were a lot of critics it can be an example for future cooperation between Vietnam and Indonesia between Russia and Indonesia also to think about common market as now we think with uh, Singapore there are some obstacles there are some dangers yes we can see but with Singapore, we can see a lot of uh, dangers than with Indonesia, because I think this uh, common market with Vietnam and the common market with Indonesia will be very effective to Russia. It will be a very solid stimul, not only uh, for cooperation in military sphere, but in other spheres. So that's my opinion, that really in our relations with Indonesia, we can speak about uh, comprehensive strategic cooperation. In fact, not in the words, but in fact, because we have uh, very, uh, very important goals for the future and we have very, a lot of common uh, in understanding current political situation in the world. So thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, my colleagues, uh, several follow-up remarks. Uh, in my opinion, Mikhail's presentation has been central for our today's discussion for a very important reason. We should be very clear and very specific about what we are going to develop. Well, this may be not a widely publicized fact, but uh, in 2012, a month before the comprehensive strategic partnership between Russia and Vietnam was established, Ru Russia established another strategic partnership, not a comprehensive uh, strategic partnership, an ordinary strategic partnership, with your attention, please, the Ukraine. And uh, the formulation was very simple. Uh, as uh, following the line of um, the global trends, uh, with the emphasis on establishing strategic partnerships, uh, the Russian Federation and uh, uh, the Ukraine decided to establish uh, a strategic partnership uh, in their relations, to elevate their relations to the level of strategic partnership. Well, I do not want to go into particulars here and now, but but um, once again, we have to specify what is meant by such and such um, kinds of relations. Uh, and uh, uh, let's hope that the example of the Russian-Ukrainian strategic partnership uh, will be uh, uh, exceptionary rather than a common rule. But uh, um, to specify the key parameters of uh, what is meant by different kinds of partnerships and uh, what or possibly which strategic tasks are going to be addressed and uh, eventually resolved by elevating cooperation to the level of strategic uh, partnerships of various kinds is a timely and a relevant exercise. Not that you and I have good relations, let's now refer uh, uh, these relations to as um, a strategic partnership or a comprehensive strategic partnership or something. And uh, here, uh, to sum everything up, in my opinion, Mikhail has raised uh, the pivotal questions about what is really meant and, uh, 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 and expected from the strategic partnership, the comprehensive strategic partnership, and uh, which specific components of the Russian Vietnamese experience can be adopted to the forthcoming strategic partnership between Russia and Indonesia. And possibly we could listen to our Indonesian colleagues uh, what they expect from this kind of relations. Uh, can I answer? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, 
Well, I, I agree that there is no one unified uh, uh, meaning of strategic partnership, but let me give you some, some uh, practical answers. Uh, usually, uh, <clears throat> strategic partnership is signed by uh, leaders uh, like president or prime minister. So this is very high level. And what happened after that? This is the foundation of the relations which could uh, followed by, <clears throat> you know, ministry and so on. Uh, <clears throat> as the basis of uh, further enhancing the relation in, in many fields. For example, in the case with uh, Australia, as I know, for example, we signed a study partnership with Russia. We have a, a mechanism, <clears throat> new mechanism of uh, a regular meeting between head of states. And then uh, we have like two by two. For example, uh, we have every year bilateral meeting between uh, two ministers, ministers of defense and minister for foreign affairs, you know, so we'll, well, we have now very intensive uh, uh, relation with, with, Australia, uh, with Russia, for example, but we don't have the new mechanism. Like we have uh, military technical cooperation, but we don't have a regular defense minister. Of course, we have uh, our dead minister coming to Russia every year, but this is on different uh, event, you know, on international uh, event organized by uh, Russia. Also from the minister, coordinating minister of political and security affairs. You know, he always come almost every year, but this is on different, Cases. Now, if I look at the experience of Vietnam, for example, uh, I think this is what we are, we, are, we are trying also to 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 imitate, if you uh, prefer that that kind of words, because uh, uh, look at this, the number of the students. You know, by my uh, Michael mentioned uh, six thousand. We have only less than seven hundred innocent students in Russia. Uh, we need maybe four or five times uh, of that. You know. And then also the trade relations. Uh, Vietnam is the first uh, country to sign the uh, FTA between Vietnam and Eurasian Economic Union. And uh, we had just started uh, to sign the MOC uh, last year. Actually, we are behind Singapore. You know, but look at the trade volume. Vietnam always number one. And uh, I asked my colleague when I was ambassador, since they signed the uh, uh, FTA with Eurasian Economic Union, the trade volume increased by 30%. You know. So, uh, <clears throat> I think, I think this is for practical reason that we need to send it. You know, uh, the documents are written now, actually, uh, but it is a matter of when our leaders will meet. And unfortunately, we have the pandemic, uh, you know, uh, our, as I mentioned, our two presidents are scheduled to meet this year to send the study pattern. There are many things uh, sent, uh, you know, especially what I'm very encouraged, one of the uh, documents to be sent is the simplification of visa uh, for Indonesians, you know. You know, up to now, it's not easy for Indonesians to visit Russia, despite the fact that, you know, after we organized four times in Indonesian festivals, uh, the number of Indonesians visiting Russia increased by six times. And Russia is one of the uh, popular destinations, but the visa is not easy. You know? So when this, there's a relaxation of the visa, I, I believe there is more Indonesian. And I think this is uh, very strategic in the future, because as I mentioned, there is ignorance on both sides. We are too far away, you know, uh, and then, and with this, there are more people coming to Russia uh, for business. For example, we have uh, with Michael Koretsen, we have a business forum during the festival, and the uh, the trend is quite encouraging. Last year, we had 1,000 Indonesian visiting for festival and hundreds of them business people, and we have uh, very good attendance on the business forum. So, I think for uh, for uh, Practical term, I think uh, we need to 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 encourage you know this this signing of uh, strategic partnership, and this will uh, broaden our relations. As you know, we had very uh, although uh, maybe it's not as as high as, as Vietnam in the case of Vietnam, but uh, we had also very good regional relation in the past, and uh, there are still many skilled people in both countries, you know, who are very uh having a very romantic relation with, with uh, russia thank you thank you uh, uh, very very mm -hmm. well thank you. can i please okay well uh, your excellency uh, thank you so much uh, for your very insightful remarks uh, and uh, as a follow-up remark um, i want uh, to raise um, well 
difficult questions uh, about um, the Russia, uh, uh, the relationship between Russia and Vietnam. Uh, and uh, uh, here, let me tell you this. Uh, well, uh, there have been some rise in the Russian-Vietnamese uh, mutual trade, as well as uh, the overall economic exchanges uh, after Russia and Vietnam concluded and uh, ratified uh, uh, after, uh, excuse me, the Eur Eurasian Economic Union and uh, uh, Vietnam uh, concluded and uh, ratified the FTA agreement. Uh, but uh, then, as uh, Mikhail demonstrated, uh, the figures uh, uh, stabilized and uh, now they, uh, the, uh, the trade turnover accounts for 4.9 for the year 2019. This is slightly bigger than several years ago. And what I am driving at is a very simple thing. In order to substantially and meaningfully increase cooperation, the economic cooperation, Vietnam has to completely revise its industrial policy. Just because if a Vietnamese enterprise has, uh, for example, a portfolio of orders uh, and uh, the Russian share is 10%, uh, uh, this enterprise uh, just doesn't need any more. If it needs only 10%, it needs only 10%. For it to need more than 10%, Vietnam once again has to completely revise its industrial policy and uh, reorient it to cooperation with Russia, to specifically developing cooperation with Russia. Russia as uh, possibly the key partner. And uh, uh, I can understand uh, Vietnamese uh, motivation to do it in the Soviet times owing to the political side of relations between the Soviet Union and Vietnam. And I do not see any reasons to expect that Vietnam wants to do it now, taking into consideration China's factor and also the fact that Vietnam is uh, part of uh, uh, is an active uh, member of supply production chains in East Asia developed by Japan and South Korea. And uh, uh, also as uh, possibly, well, another point that also deserves mentioning, let me tell you this. At present, uh, to develop really meaningful cooperation, three, economic cooperation, three basic components are necessary. First, supply production chains. Um, this is, um, uh, really a vital prerequisite uh, and uh, Russia is outside uh, this uh, supply production chains uh, just because, uh, well, it has always been outside uh, this uh, cooperation and uh, I personally do not expect, uh, I do not see any reasons to expect uh, that uh, Russia will be able to end uh, these uh, chains. Then institutions, and here FTAs are necessary because FTAs is not about just lowering, uh, uh, eliminating tariffs and uh, non-tariff barriers. This is about specifying the legal side of cooperation. Uh, for example, what to do in um, uh, the force majeure circumstances and in case uh, uh, um, in case I encounter losses, uh, I want to be compensated. Uh, uh, and uh, here, the legal part of cooperation prescribed by FTAs is uh, a necessary, if not uh, the vital precondition. And then the digital side of cooperation, uh, these um, exchanges, trade exchanges uh, should be supported by digital platforms. And here, Russia is very unlikely to out outperform China in terms of the B2B and the B2C uh, dimensions of cooperation because uh, the Chinese electronic retailers are presently very active in Southeast Asia and uh, the both the industrial and the consumption sectors of Southeast Asia are reorienting slowly but steadily towards China. And um, here, uh, once again, much can be spoken about uh, the necessity to uh, uh, increase uh, uh, economic cooperation, uh, for example, trade and investment uh, uh, cooperation, but in order to practically implement this uh, uh, these priorities, uh, uh, the Asia-Pacific countries uh, need to revise their industrial policies and reorient these policies 
to a more intensive cooperation with Russia. And um, frankly speaking, I do not see any tangible reasons to expect that um, they are ready to do it. And uh, well, uh, uh, friends, so we are involved in a frank uh, and uh, um, open-hearted uh, discussion and uh, um, uh, in my opinion, this is the most appropriate when you taking into consideration a, a very high level of presentation. Uh, in my opinion, top intellectuals specializing in Southeast Asian studies uh, are here now, and this is uh, the most appropriate venue and uh, the most appropriate audience to discuss these questions. And these questions should be discussed uh, freely and frankly between friends. And uh, this is uh, very important, in my opinion. Well, <laughs> okay, yeah, I think that's that's very uh, good comment. But uh, I believe uh, economic cooperation, people to people, this are uh, very uh, two important uh, venue, you know, for uh, <clears throat> having a better relation with uh, Russia, and that's why we are very keen to uh, proceed uh, with the uh, signing of. FTA, well, at first uh, distance could matter, but it is not really like, for example, you know, a country as far as Ecuador uh, could dominate the uh, export of banana, you know, 96% uh, of banana in uh, uh, Russia uh, imported from Ecuador. Uh, at the same time, Ecuador also presents the same thing like Indonesia. So, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning that, you know, the the characteristic, the nature of our relation trade is, is complementary. We need, so, you know, we 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 have a, or we import uh, like uh, 12 million uh, tons of grain every year, and we started import uh, importing from Russia only in the last two years, and the number is growing, growing. We don't eat, I mean, we 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 don't grow grain, but we are one of the biggest uh, eater of noodle in the world after China. We need we need wheat, we need grain, and we need from from, from apart from that from from many countries we need from Russia, but also you need palm oil from Indonesia. So uh, there are many things that uh, we can do. That's why we organize the festival. And uh, what we want to aim with the festival, this is like one-stop shopping, you know. Uh, and uh, I can guarantee, so all those uh, Indonesians who first came to Russia, uh, they found it very something different. You know? The first time when we organized the festival 2016, I invited 30 companies for free. It's very very difficult for me. I have to come person by person, individual by individual. But when they come here and they see Russia is so different, the people just like us, so they're multicultural, and they realize that, look, and I told them, look, Russia is even the home of the biggest Muslim country in, in Europe. And uh, the, the uh, history of Islam and Orthodox has been so long. Uh, even, you know, I, I mentioned, and they don't believe that in uh, 19, and then 988, when Prince Vladimir wanted to uh, make uh, state religions, and there are three religions uh, considered, and one is Islam. Why Islam does not, uh, uh, you know, preferred because uh, you cannot drink alcohol, you know, as simple as that. <laughs> but but uh, now with this, uh, you know, approach, you know, multi-dimensional approach, uh, and we got support from the Moscow government, I appreciate it very much. The interest from Indonesia to visit Russia is growing every year. Uh, of course, the problem is no direct flight from both. Uh, like uh, uh, Michael uh, mentioned, uh, you know, 600,000 uh, tourists from Russia visiting uh, Vietnam every year. But even this, without the direct flight, last year, 160 from Russia increased by 100% from 2016. So, uh, this first thing. The second is uh, uh, institution, uh, I think I agree with you. and. Uh, also, one thing that we like, like also to uh, pursue the uh, cooperation in, on, on digital economy. And it is interesting during uh, last uh, seminar uh, organized uh, by the embassy and MGMO, uh, we had uh, one uh, young businessman who uh, specialized in digital economy, and he is one of the uh, most successful uh, startup. You know, he owns a startup company called Bukalapa in, in Indonesia. And there is much more uh, opportunities, you know, from both, you know, to work together because, uh, you know, especially during this pandemic, uh, there is something that 
the maybe not many uh, area of business who could develop very well uh, apart from from digital economy yeah thank you it was uh, i think a very interesting discussion and i was uh, to ask other participants uh, participants of our conference uh, to take part and maybe uh, to present their commentaries or some questions do we have other questions and other commentaries I think it's a very interesting uh, discussion and we have uh, mentioned vital points of uh, international relation and two side relations between Russia and Indonesia. I think it was very right question that if we uh, construct a um, strategic partnership, if we develop uh, preferable relations with Indonesia, we have to change uh, our relations with other countries and with the, this example with Ecuador, I think it's a very important example because why we have to buy 96% of all bananas in Ecuador and other maybe uh, and uh, another very important question is institutions. I think it's a very important question because we have uh, the right institution for cooperation with Ecuador and we don't have institutions uh, or companies to, uh, for cooperation with Indonesia. I think so. And I think it's a state purpose, it's a state goal to, to change this, to rebalance uh, these economic ties from uh, one country to another country, or to make, for example, 50% from Ecuador and 50% from Indonesia. It will be a good step, and it will be, I think, a good example for uh, ameliorating relations. Uh, it will be a good, very good sign. And uh, another, uh, I have a question to uh, Ekaterin. I'm not sure that Ekaterin is uh, still with us, uh, but uh, it was a very interesting uh, moment and element in uh, her presentation. Uh, it's about uh, the dangers uh, from Russia, uh, from Russian relation with the United States to relations of ASEAN countries. Uh, with the, the United States also, that Russia, if they will, will develop uh, relations with Russia, it will affect uh, their relations with the United States because Russia is under sanctions from the United States. I think it's a very, uh, how to say, it's a new turn in our understanding of the situation. It may be, what do you think? Is it a new obstacle for developing uh, relations between Russia and ASEAN countries? And don't you think that this obstacle is serious uh, or it's an obstacle for a very short period of time? What do you think about this? Yeah, I'm still here. Thank you, Dmitry uh, Valentin, for your question and for your attention. Um, you see that uh, the, uh, well, Russia is under sanctions for how many? Six, six years already. Uh, under American sanctions and European Union sanctions. And Japan is only formally in, but uh, there are repercussions for particularly small and medium enterprises. Because if there is a political will, and I, of course, might be subjective, and I see only part of the picture because I'm not dealing with Japan uh, on a daily basis, but I know from um, my colleagues and friends that uh, particularly small and medium enterprises are very uh, cautious uh, with meddling with Russians uh, in the situation then uh, there are sanctions. Big business can survive. If there is a political will, uh, big business will work and is working uh, with Russia. I mean, uh, business from countries uh, who officially joined uh, sanctions. In Southeast Asia, the situation is slightly different because the very first uh, target was the banking uh, sector. And uh, we all know that uh, the financial system is very much interconnected with uh, American financial system, that uh, there are banks which might not be officially linked to uh, to the U.S. financial institutions, but still there are uh, well, uh, such instruments like SWIFT, not a governmental structure, but still uh, under the uh, strong influence. And uh, this, uh, well, these links, these uh, interconnections, they also prevent a certain number of uh, financial institutions in Southeast Asia, I would 
put it mildly, to uh, stop or to froze or to uh, somehow uh, slow down operations uh, with uh, Russian business. And that's a repercussion, a, a certain blow uh, on uh, our, in, in uh, indirect uh, blow on our relations with uh, Southeast Asia in the economic, uh, economic sphere. We all know the case of Silavui uh, Mashina, uh, how to translate it uh, correctly. Uh, in, into English. Uh, the case of uh, power machines, uh, sorry if I'm not uh, ex um, exact in my translation, uh, who failed in Vietnam and M Mikhail, I think, can tell us volumes about uh, this. Uh, that's a private company, as, as I understand, but uh, the, the company which faced uh, very imp important problems um, not be, being able to get money transfers exactly because of the impediments in the uh, financial in national financial operations and now comes the military technical sphere another one is uh, by the way oil and gas and uh, i wonder what will be going with, with this one it's not a secret that our um, Oh, well, one of our uh, strongest points in relations with our partners in Asia is our military technical cooperation. So we now see the uh, the pressure the pressure here. Uh, will uh, Southeast Asian countries? Uh, I would not say be strong enough. Will uh, we both, uh, our partners in Asia and we, be wise enough to find the ways how to? Uh, uh, how to solve uh, this issue that's that's a big question i'm just uh, uh, an observer i don't know i know that there are ways to uh, to to find ways out um of uh, of such situations but uh, there there must be a certain desire to do that sorry for this <laughs> you know in indirect uh, answer half indirect answer but we are on the record Thank you. It was not a direct, it was a direct answer. And I think our friend uh, Alexander Popov told us how to use uh, other methods uh, to develop uh, ties in military sphere, in economic sphere, without any sanctions uh, from the United States. Maybe, uh, Alexander, maybe you can tell us maybe about some acute problems in uh, our relations with Indonesia in the economic sphere. Uh, you have made a brilliant presentation on military cooperation, but we have other spheres of cooperation, and I think maybe you know uh, the problems, and maybe these problems also connected with the obstacles from the United States, maybe. So please tell us. Thank you very much, Professor, for this opportunity again. And uh, I don't think that uh, there are many problems uh, in uh, civilian uh, fields in our cooperation, uh, depending on uh, uh, USA sanctions. It's first of all concerning our cooperation in the uh, military field. And uh, uh, frankly speaking, uh, we're already uh, talking about the possibility of raising our economic cooperation especially in the, uh, our trade for many, many years. And the figure of 5 billion US dollars uh, was uh, mentioned at least since uh, 2016. But as far as I know, until now, we cannot reach this figure. And uh, it is, uh, first of all, maybe due uh, to the absence uh, of uh, knowledge uh, in uh, uh, each uh, party. Uh, first of all, maybe uh, there is a lack of knowledge in uh, uh, Russia about the economic possibilities of uh, Indonesia in trade and uh, vice versa. And uh, uh, the last figures for 2019 2019 that uh, the Indonesian uh, export to Russia reached only uh, 861 million US dollars. It's Indonesian figures actually. 
and uh, the import from uh, Russia 1.2 billion. So totally uh, just uh, 2 billion US dollars, so much less than 5 billion US dollars. And uh, in this case, uh, there are still many, many uh, possibilities uh, uh, because uh, Russia uh, has uh, uh, much, many, many commodities which could be suggested to Indonesia, especially in the field of civilian equipment. Uh, for example, uh, right now, uh, as far as we know, Indonesia uh, uh, needs uh, special equipment uh, for uh, medical uh, purposes, uh, especially uh, for uh, helping people uh, with uh, COVID uh, problems. And uh, Russia uh, has such equipment and can suggest to Indonesia. Yes. Uh, and uh, we just, uh, when, when the situation uh, uh, becomes normal, certainly we must uh, raise the exchange of information. We already talking about this thing many, many times, but uh, frankly speaking, uh, outside of a festival, which is arranged by His Excellency every year, uh, nothing much is happening. And uh, uh, also, there is a lack uh, of cooperation in the field uh, of investment. We uh, heard uh, what are achievements in uh, Russian-Vietnamese uh, relations in this case, 3 billion and 1 billion. And in uh, Russia-Indonesian relations, we cannot see any achievements. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, all our uh, projects in Indonesia, like we know that uh, Rosneft, uh, uh, Russian railways, we holding and uh, uh, Black Space and some others, uh, unfortunately, uh, haven't shown much progress. And uh, unfortunately, we don't see any investment projects from Indonesian side. Though on the first stage uh, of our uh, relations uh, in the uh, atmosphere of uh, creating a market economy in uh, Russia. There were some Indonesian companies which would like to invest uh, into Russian economies. Why it's not happening right now, frankly speaking, I don't understand. Uh, uh, so maybe, maybe in this case, we should uh, again mention the lack of uh, cooperation between our financial institutions. Uh, because uh, the absence uh, of Indonesian banks in Russia and the uh, absence of Russian banks in Indonesia certainly uh, uh, don't uh, doesn't doesn't does, doesn't help our cooperation. So maybe our financial authorities uh, must think about it more properly, uh, and uh, uh, certainly. Uh, the creation of uh, mutual mutual uh, banking uh, cooperation uh, will help also uh, our cooperation in military field, which I mentioned, because what I uh, suggested is just only uh, one possibility, but we still uh, have to continue uh, the possible uh, payments uh, within the usual banking methods. Thank you. Well, okay, friends, uh, possibly please. we should ask Mikhail Kuritsin to outline his vision on uh, the key reasons uh, uh, for some uh, setbacks okay. in relations between Russia and Indonesia. As far as I am informed, Mikhail Vyacheslavovich chairs the Russian-Indonesian Business Council, and uh, he may provide us with really valuable information. Well. What would you say about it? Thank you. Thank you for, for the invitation to attend this uh, uh, forum. And I'm very much impressed by four presentations. Uh, first of all, starting from the presentation of His Excellency Ambassador, the very uh, deep analysis and uh, a lot of very correct judgments and which I definitely share. Uh, 
Uh, I'm very much impressed by presentations of uh, uh, Alexander Popov uh, and uh, Yekaterina by, first of all, because uh, in these presentations, uh, starting from Alexander, I think uh, we are talking about not just uh, judgment of the surface of the events and what is visible um, above the above the water but uh, it's uh, deep analysis and at the same time uh, the fact it's uh, evidence of uh, personal involvement in the process of negotiations and all the uh, preparation and decision making in uh, the field of military industrial cooperation uh, a very provocative uh, uh, presentation of Ekaterina and a lot of questions which she, she raised uh, do not give immediate answers, but instead uh, provoke all of us to um, uh, uh, look for solutions, look for answers, and uh, it's very valuable. Uh, for the first time I uh, was hearing a uh, presentation of Michael and uh, his uh, Vietnamese experience. By coincidence, for the last 25 years, I'm, I'm one of the shareholders together with the Rostech of Russian-Indonesian joint venture, uh, Visorotex, uh, joint venture, uh, rubber plantation, and uh, a small uh, uh, tire factory in uh, uh, the suburbs of Ho Chi Minh. And, with all my respect to bilateral relations with Vietnam, I have, uh, I would not uh, so much uh, uh, take example of uh, Russia-Vietnamese economic ties uh, as the um, obligatory scenario where Russia-Indonesian relations should go. Some examples could be very uh, positive uh, to copy, but a lot of cases we have in Russia-Vietnamese relationship, we should rather uh, we should rather uh, keep in mind and um, uh, avoid this kind of consequences. Uh, by the way, uh, joining of Vietnam uh, of um, uh, FTA with uh, Eurasian Economic Union, uh, according to some analysis, has. Uh, uh, sacrificed a uh, certain portion of bilateral trade with uh, in between Russia and Indonesia because in some cases uh, and we have uh, confirmation of this in some cases Indonesian goods uh, being supplied to Russian market and see market of uh, Eurasian Union through Vietnam lately avoiding avoiding direct um, either duties or in some cases uh, because of the uh, well-organized, uh, I would put it in a soft way, Vietnamese network of relationship with the Russian authorities, starting from customs and up to the distribution uh, networks. They, uh, they basically, Vietnamese are more efficient in uh, competition in the Russian market than uh, let's say Indonesian traders and Indonesian exporters. And from this point of view, I definitely um, support and anticipate um, uh, signing of the uh, bilateral agreement, FTA agreement uh, between European uh, Eurasian uh, Economic Union and Indonesia. Hopefully it can be happening before the end of this year. Uh, on uh, my very good friend, partner, and uh, colleague, Alexander Popov, and 99% of uh, uh, what we are doing, what he is doing, uh, basically we are doing together and we are sharing the same views. But unfortunately, I have to disagree with Alexander when we are talking about non-military cooperation between Russia and Indonesia and American factory, American sanction factory in it. I would put it uh, this way probably because I'm already for the last 30 years, I'm not anymore um, staff of the Russian Soviet embassies overseas and I have a little bit more freedom to express uh, uh, views. Uh, I believe that the purpose of US sanctions against Russia was not necessarily directly 
uh, do something in bilateral relations, but uh, uh, instead to interfere in the relationship, relationship between Russia and the third countries. And from this point of view, uh, we are now facing the situation when Russia relations with any country, including Indonesia, is actually relations at the same time with the United States. We have to take it uh, into account. We have always to um, uh, look uh, beyond the corner and watch what Americans, how Americans would judge, how Americans would perform. Unfortunately, uh, in Indonesia, there is very strong uh, pro-American lobby. Uh, I would not put these people as, uh, let's say, uh, anti-Russian lobby. It's uh, the absolutely different, uh, different angle of views. It's, uh, uh, it's patriotic people who feel that they cannot afford sacrifice uh, relations with the United States for the benefits of re developing relations with Russia. And uh, unfortunately, um, uh, in a lot of cases, we face this uh, dilemma and we face this uh, directly being uh, shared with us views of uh, uh, our friends from Indonesia. And uh, I believe that uh, to a certain extent in Indonesia, there is underestimation of its own role as a regional superpower. Uh, underestimation of its own dependence from uh, third countries. I believe that Indonesia um, uh, does not have enough information uh, about uh, other countries' uh, um, capability to uh, face U.S. sanctions and still for its national benefits cooperate with Russia and what Alexander Popov mentioned in his presentation is absolutely true, especially countries like Turkey, countries uh, like Germany uh, and uh, uh, Japan. Uh, let's not forget, Germany is still uh, occupied by United States. American troops are on Germany territory since uh, 1945. Uh, Japan is still occupied by United States and they did not have even a short break since Second World War and their military presence is over there. Definitely, uh, they are very much uh, dependent on the United States, but still, they are looking for an opportunity to uh, uh, cooperate, to do something with Russia, and even for the purpose of their uh, more freedom of dealing with the United States. Uh, Turkey has achieved much more in their relationship with the United States by showing the U.S. that they are independent country with uh, free and active foreign policy. And from this point of view, they actually uh, managing to put it, put it in a rough word, milking both. Um, from this point of view, uh, I believe that Indonesia uh, is overestimating uh, U.S. sanctions, uh, the risk of U.S. sanctions, and from this point of view, uh, we need to find some kind of forum um, of uh, resolving matters, which otherwise would not permit us not to, not only uh, not even dream about strategic partnership, but even talk about uh, more or less substantial increase of bilateral trade. Let's be realistic; it is very serious difficulty in simply. Uh, creating banking support for uh, bilateral uh, uh, commercial contracts. Uh, Indonesian banks, in a lot of cases, uh, are not prepared uh, to deal with Russian banks because uh, the representatives of the U.S. Embassy, uh, well-known people with the names and title uh, from the embassy, basically they are uh, visiting uh, chief executives of Indonesian banks and suggesting that uh, they do not recommend to, to deal with Russia. And we are talking about non-military, non-political, absolutely commercial transactions. And definitely it's uh, 
uh, it is absolutely uh, not in accordance with international law, not in accordance with um, uh, World Trade Organization rules and regulations. And from this point of view, uh, definitely we feel that uh, uh, again and again, uh, uh, Russia has this uh, tendency and habit of believing in dreams. Uh, we were for many years uh, uh, knocking the door of WTO, uh, in, uh, involved in the relation in the negotiations with the, the WTO regarding the joining of this organization. At the end of the day, once we joined it, uh, then the United States explained to all of us that basically WTO is not, not anymore uh, the right place to uh, to. Uh, uh, decide the rules, uh, to define the rules and regulations in the global trade. And from this point of view, we need for, we need, as uh, Alexander Popov rightly mentioned, we need relations, discussions, negotiations, talks between um, banking community. Uh, because otherwise, we as business community, we feel that uh, we, we do not have uh, instrumentality to to execute the deals. I would not. I would not. Uh, uh, I, I I believe that it will be absolutely unfair to say that uh, the projects mentioned in our discussion of uh, investment cooperation, like Russian railways project in East Kalimantan. Uh, Ross Neft project, uh, Black Space, we holding that they became victims of sanctions or became victims of the non resolvement of uh, um, uh, financial transaction issues. Absolutely not correct. Uh, each particular project has its own uh, background and the reasons why it was not implemented the right way. Um, another project which was on the um, uh, in the agenda, uh, including the agenda of the bilateral talks between the presidents and uh, uh, was discussed uh, uh, during the visit of uh, President Yudo Yona to uh, Sochi, uh, a pro project of Prusal, Ursal, yeah, again, very specific case under sanctions, again, US sanctions, as a result, non-capability to provide uh, pre-planned financing for aluminum refinery to be built in Indonesia. Uh, just to summarize, a uh, very a good instrument, I mean this uh, Zoom conference, uh, to, uh, I, I definitely I hope that this COVID uh, quarantine will end uh, as soon as possible and uh, we will be in a position to travel and to meet each other and nothing can uh, replace um, uh, uh, direct contact. But at the same time, um, this technological solution, this uh, possibility, any time to um, uh, organize uh, uh, a video conference and discuss matters, I think it should help not only us, but other uh, communities, including, let's say, business community, banking community, uh, other uh, parties involved to uh, exchange views, to not to delay their discussions until the better time, because uh, uh, life is very short, time is very limited. What we fail to do, we cannot then compensate. And uh, from, this, from this point of view, we still believe that best years of bilateral cooperation were somewhere in late 50s, beginning of 60s. But I hope that we will be in a position to um, uh, to uh, uh, delegate to our kids uh, uh, much more matured bilateral relations independently, whether we would call it strategic partnership or not. I would prefer avoid this name if instead we will have real cooperation. And I will be very much uh, dissatisfied if we will manage to cover the lack of investment projects, the shortage of bilateral trade, the lack of uh, capability to overcome the real uh, uh, difficulties and to use the opportunities, but we will cover it by um, a name of strategic partnership without uh, real uh, deep substance in it. 
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you greatly. It was really uh, next presentation and very interesting and very accurate. And I think uh, a lot of questions that we discussed before, now they were resolved by uh, your presentation. And now I want to ask maybe, uh, I have, I think Nikita Kuklin, uh, he uh, from uh, University of Friendship, he wanted also to, to take part in our discussion. Uh, Nikita, where are you? I'm here. If I may, thank you so much. Yes, yeah, so please, uh, you wait yes, for uh, me. I'm Nikita Kuklin, uh, assistant at the Department of Theory and History of International Relations, uh, People's Friendship University, and discussing the strategic uh, partnership of Indonesia and Russia. Uh, I am, I think, uh, in this case, I very much agree with His Excellency Ambassador and uh, Professor Popov. Uh, in my opinion, uh, much attention now is paid to the official side and classical issues, economic issues, military cooperation, and something like that. And I also understand that it is traditional for Russian diplomacy and for Indonesian diplomacy to discuss these uh, things. But uh, do not forget that social cultural factors and contexts, mutual perception uh, play a large role in this situation. For example, we can establish a wonderful partnership at the level of high officials, uh, at the official level of representatives and experts, which are very good informed. But when it becomes widespread, it reaches the level of ordinary people, they ask, the question who these uh, Russians are and how to build cooperation with them. And here the Indonesians will be very surprised that we are similar, we have similar values and sometimes understanding of the world, but we need to inform each other and to know each other and contact uh, from time to time yeah, and to establish long-term contacts uh, on the basis of our culture, uh, values, and other foundations which are really quite similar. Uh, I can also add the example of Australia. Uh, with advanced scientific research and uh, many other things connected to uh, Indonesian and Australian society communication. Uh, I can say that Australians are <laughs> really close to understand uh, the Indonesian culture, the Javanese culture, and many other traditional uh, things in Indonesian culture, but I can say that uh, Australians are very successful at the scientific level of understanding. And that's uh, very important. This mutual understanding will help to overcome difficulties in all spheres, in military cooperation, in trade. Uh, for example, compare their perception of the Chinese people in Russia at the beginning of the century and now. It's a result of great work by our diplomats, Chinese diplomats, uh, and the strategic partnership development. And now we understand, uh, for example, in Russia, we understand their Chinese culture, yeah, the values of this society, uh, the goals and achievements of uh, this state as a global power. And for Indonesia, we need to do the same. We need to establish and develop the cooperation at this level. That's my opinion. Thank you. Uh, can can I have some? Yes, please. Uh, well, thank you, Pa Gurisin, Pa Popov. Uh, we have always a dispute on figures, especially on trade. Uh, pa Popov mentioned from the Indonesian uh, Strategic Bureau, but uh, if you look at the federal custom, it is different figures. Uh, the according to the federal custom, uh, we enjoyed a surplus, so quite significant number. So. But if I look at the comparison with the ASEAN figures, for example, Vietnam 2016, uh, the trade uh, relation in, uh, decreased by 20%. And Thailand 9%, Singapore 37%, Philippines 7%, Indonesia 5%. <clears throat> so only Malaysia uh, enjoyed the uh, uh, positive uh, uh, sign uh, last year. So, I mean, it's, it's not that bad. No? under uh, current situation. And actually the uh, pandemic issues uh, stop us from doing much more. Uh, Minister of Trade actually was scheduled to visit uh, Russia to further uh, negotiate on the FTA. Uh, this is the first step to for negotiation. Unfortunately, we cannot do that. And also 
we have inquiries from a big innovation companies uh, uh, to come and meet their counterpart uh, thanks to the business forum organized by the embassy but of course uh, they cannot do that uh, but uh, they keep asking when we can fly to to russia so this is the dilemma that uh, we are facing but most positive thing is about the investment if i look at the uh, data from the bureau of statistics from indonesia uh, 2019 there was an increase of 740 percent investment <clears throat> uh, and the first quarter increased by 800 percent so it's it's encouraging despite the fact that the number is not that big i mean still number 34 33 if you look at the rank of the investment in but the interest is growing and i would like also to mention about rosnef uh, with uh, mr popov popov but uh, uh, I had a video conference two weeks ago with the chairman of Investment Coding Board, and uh, he's very much uh, progressive. He was a former uh, businessman, so he knows uh, how to handle with some you know, bureaucratic uh, hurdles. And uh, I met uh, him uh, one month before. I mentioned about the problem faced by Rosneft, and uh, the complaint was met with a very uh, uh, decisive uh, action. Uh, actually, uh, he mentioned uh, two weeks ago that there's no more problem of land clearing in Indonesia, so everything is, is settled down and uh, Rosneft is doing off. Um, um, of course, I have to admit that some other projects, uh, the development is not very encouraging, but uh, with this new uh, man in the investment board, I think we can do something. So that's why I uh, always ask uh, some of Russian business who have problem is let us know and uh, now we have uh, very good relation with our friend in Indonesia. So it is not, uh, uh, I mean, uh, there's no like something like, you know, uh, maybe big uh, leap of uh, relation in terms of trade, but uh, I'm, I'm sure that what we have uh, done during the last four years uh, with the festival, it encourages more uh, people to keep a contact, business to be business to contact between the two countries. So uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. My colleagues, I beg your pardon. Mikhail Terskih wants to ask, uh, answer the question asked by one of our Indonesian participants, Ifra. Misha, could you please do it? Thank you. And first of all, thank you for the question. The question is, uh, well, how can we arrange the relations between uh, uh, Russia and uh, Southeast Asian countries? And uh, first of all, I like to say that it's just impossible to arrange these relations because uh, like it's the same as we if we try to arrange people like who is better uh, Vasya or Ivan uh, because it's absolutely absolutely impossible for example uh, Vasily can be better uh, in terms of I don't know in uh, in maths uh, but uh, he is worse in other sphere but we cannot combine it together uh, the same thing with the countries. We cannot uh, arrange relations with uh, different countries. And I, well, I, I excuse if I uh, offended somebody by uh, saying in my presentation that in some spheres relations between Russia and Vietnam are a little bit a bit step ahead of relations with Indonesia. It was also not really correct. Uh, but well, if we take statistics here, we can compare. But we cannot compare, well, 90% of the spheres because uh, they are not so obvious to be compared. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It was very, very good answer uh, question, especially on Vasi and Peter, who is the best. <laughs> yes, but I think, yes, we have uh, once uh, all of the traditional strategic partner in Vietnam. But I also want to mention that uh, the current situation uh, also complicated our relation with Vietnam because at the same time we can see United States and its policy in Vietnam and it's also as in all Southeast Asia we can see that the United States is forming uh, how to say some union not only against China but now and it's I think it's one of the most interesting um, how to say uh, conclusions of our discussion that we can see that the United States also form union against Russia and against developing relations between Russia and uh, the Southeast Asian countries and uh, Indonesia also. And now I think we're working for uh, two and a half hours, more than two and a half hours. 
maybe if there are some other commentaries or questions so please it will be uh, you're welcome but uh, i think that we have a short time i have five uh, or ten minutes and then we have some rest and then we'll continue at th uh, 3 uh, 15 pm we'll continue and there will be also very interesting presentations and i think that we will be able to continue our discussion so i think now that we have uh, maybe better we'll have some rest and then at 3 and 15 pm we'll be back again and we'll listen a new presentation and then there will be a new discussion uh, i think it's uh, uh, it's will be a very good reason now to have some rest but if you have some other uh, points of view so please tell us mm -hmm. uh, Zhenya, uh, what do you think about this we can close our first uh, well uh, friends uh, we have some fixed commitments because uh, one of our colleagues from australia is scheduled for 15 and the quarter uh, 3 uh, 15 pm uh, mark Bison, he is a well-known australian uh, expert and uh, uh, he has some prior commitments so, so he asked about this fixed time and possibly to finalize our discussion this panel of our discussion let me ask possibly the last question which goes to all the participants of our conference uh, and this question has two parts well mikhail vicheslavovich has absolutely correctly pointed out uh, that uh, the strategic partnership is possibly too demanding and uh, it's uh, uh, it takes uh, a lot of pains and efforts uh, just to develop uh, the relations between Russia and Indonesia at the ordinary level, not to say about at some privileged level of strategic partnership or something, even uh, uh, an ordinary course of relations between Russia and Indonesia as far as uh, the economic cooperation is concerned is problematic and he, outli he has outlined the key reasons why it is really so. And uh, my question is as follows. Well, two questions. Why strategic partnership and why now? Why strategic partnership? Well, is it just the slogan of the day? I like this formulation and let's elevate our relations to the level of strategic partnership. And why now? I suppose that Russian and Indonesian policymakers are well informed about the present difficulties encountered by Russia, that the Russian Federation is under international sanctions. And these sanctions are not directed against Russia just uh, from the bilateral perspective they are aimed at creating i would say unfriendly international milieu to raise doubts and apprehensions about uh, the necessity and the expediency of cooperating with russia not that we discourage you from cooperating with the russian federation just uh, we do not recommend and uh, this uh, recommendation is something really serious to follow well and once again colleagues why strategic partnership which means a kind of privileged relationship something more than just ordinary friendly relations between two countries and why now your excellency could you please outline your vision yeah well uh, as i mentioned uh, <clears throat> the strategic partnerships will be like the foundation uh, <clears throat> uh, for much broadening our relationships and usually after signing the strategic partnership followed by new mechanism you know and this is more more institutionalized this is what we done with uh, we have uh, some 14 uh, countries uh, with that strategic partnership. And I think with that such long history, it's, it's too late. And that's why the sooner the better for us. And now it is a matter of timing how we could arrange the meeting between our two leaders. So uh, this is my answer. Mikhail Vichlovich. 
Could you please give the floor? Honest, honestly, for me, the, uh, the, first of all, I very much appreciate my uh, senior colleague and friend, Ambassador, His Excellency, uh, uh, and and uh, for me, uh, this particular statement, this particular judgment, is very, very valuable. Um, I uh, really believe that if uh, His Excellency, knowing much more than each of us, independently, individually, and all of us together, uh, cumulatively, uh, uh, first of all, knowing the perception of Indonesian leadership, if uh, His Excellency believes that by uh, meeting each other, two of our leaders, can uh, reach uh, this uh, uh, declaration of a strategic partnership and formalize it. And as a result of this declaration, we will have additional uh, boost for all the aspects of bilateral relations, especially uh, uh, not uh, uh, in the field of political collaboration where I believe we have a very high level of understanding and uh, real working together. But first of all, in, in the field of uh, uh, cooperation in uh, the practical spheres of uh, trade, uh, investment, uh, uh, intellectual and uh, technological uh, transfers, uh, tourism. Uh, if His Excellency believes in it and believing His Excellency, I raise two of my hands. Let's make it happen. Uh, that's 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 uh, the the uh, the only judgment I have, and uh, I'm very much uh, optimistic uh, in general in my life. Uh, uh, that's why I have been, I had uh, a lot of uh, 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 not only successful, but also not very successful results of many projects, probably too over optimistic. But in this case, I would vote with two of my hands. Um, again, let's make it happen. We work together in order to um, facilitate uh, the bilateral meeting, to facilitate the high visits. Uh, both leaders uh, uh, committed and uh, lately uh, talking on the uh, telephone line have reconfirmed their willingness uh, to visit each other. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, as uh, we know, unfortunately, President uh, Joko Widodo uh, uh, does not have a possibility to visit St. Petersburg Economic Forum where uh, he was invited to visit it and also V-Day uh, Befele in Moscow because of COVID. Uh, unfortunately, visit of President Putin to Indonesia, which was scheduled uh, on uh, this year, unfortunately not yet fixed uh, 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 with the specific dates. But uh, we will be doing all our best in order to, uh, in order to make it happen. Uh, and definitely very, very important part with all the uh, pessimism about the formalities and uh, uh, let's say papers for papers. I really believe that uh, joining of free trade agreements uh, with Eurasian Economic Union by Indonesia can give us additional uh, opportunities of overcoming bureaucratic difficulties and uh, uh, making bilateral relations more straightforward without, let's say, minimizing the uh, dependence on the third parties, especially if we're talking about other ASEAN countries, which, uh, first of all, Vietnam and Singapore, let's uh, put it directly, uh, when we need to avoid um, uh, certain uh, additional fees, import duties, when we want to ship goods from Russia to Indonesia and vice versa. And uh, uh, that, that's, that's the point. Uh, and I, I, from this point of view, I definitely share uh, His Excellency's perception. Thank you. Now, give, I give an example like uh, what we have with Australia, for example, because I've been there for 11 years. Our relation with Australia is much more difficult than our relation with Russia because we don't have 
much political problem and as mentioned by Michael, we have much more common interest in international forum and so on. Uh, but since we signed the partnership and we institutionalized uh, the uh, meeting, uh, regular meeting between high rank uh, level uh, officer and uh, now we already signed the FTA with Australia, the trend of trade is moving forward and also the numbers of people coming to and from Indonesia has also so despite the fact that we have much, much more difficult relation with us. This is, I think, uh, something that, you know, for me, it's my uh, strong commitment that to make it happen. Thank you. Inshallah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you greatly. Now I think that uh, we have some time for, 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 for our rest. And at the 3.15 uh, p.m., we'll be here, I think that uh, we'll be here once again because it will be a very interesting presentation of Mark Beeson, and then there will be other interesting presentation, and we'll continue our brilliant conference because really it's very interesting and it's unusually very, very interesting and very accurate. So I think thank you for all participants for this first part, and I wish to see you uh, in one hour and uh, 15 minutes uh, on our second part. So thank you, and I think that we can uh, close our first session. Thank you greatly.